So yeah, thanks for having me. It's, been, it's great. And really, I got my start in CRFG in the Monterey Bay chapter. My parents live in Aptos. And um, really, it's credit to Ellen and Freddie who got me into this. I was through their avocado interests and also their, their apple tastings that I got. I had already sort of been interested in growing generally, but not specifically sort of um, the breadth of, of species and, you know, of sort of California climates that you might be able to grow in. Um, and Ellen and Freddie do send their regrets. They're oh, yeah, they're not in the wilderness yeah. right now, unfortunately, but they'll catch the recording. Yeah, so it was really thanks to them and thanks to so many people who are, some of whom are here today, um, who I've learned a lot from over the last, I don't know, I've been in CRFG, I guess, about eight years um, and been growing these things maybe about 10 years. Um, so basically, it's the time that I have been back in California. I had moved to Massachusetts for a couple of years and then came back and um, then really started focusing on subtropicals and tropicals. So, so I want to just start by saying I have no formal expertise in any of this. This is just opinion and anecdote. I'm going to mispronounce various plant families and species. Um, I try to sort of categorize them as best as I can. I'm sure there's going to be errors in the process. Um, I'm going to talk about, I went through and made a big spreadsheet. I can share the spreadsheet later if anybody's interested of the species I'm going to talk about today. And so it turned out to be 147 species um, that I'm going to talk about. I know that's going to be kind of crazy. It's going to be a whirlwind tour through these of subtropical and tropical species across 38 plant families. Um, and over the last 10 years, I've propagated something like 4,000 plants or trees um, through various methods, you know, everything, seed cutting, grafting, and so on. Um, it's mostly been, you know, when it, the average it out is about 400 a year. It's mostly just because I, lots of times I'm growing stuff and giving it away. And part of that is because I have not actually had my own space to grow in this entire time. And so it actually forces me to propagate more because I sort of grow things and then give them to people. Um, and so the outline of what I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to give you an overview of sort of how I'm thinking about this. We're going to do a whirlwind tour through species. It's going to be a little crazy. So I'm going to group them by family because there often are commonalities at sort of the family level. Um, and I'm going to try to give a little bit of opinion about what worked, what didn't. A lot of things are things that have not fruited yet for me. I mean, some of these things are tropicals, which even in Hawaii or something will take eight years or 10 years to fruit. And in a container, even in Southern California, it's going to be much longer. So some of these have not fruited for me. I've mostly avoided buying trees. I mean, I sometimes do, but mostly I try to start things either from seed or from cutting or grafting. And so it does take longer that way. And it, you know, it doesn't give you that head start. Um, Flavor and practicality, um, I'll talk a little bit about that and try to break it down about, you know, what might be appropriate for sort of the Northern California chapters. And then um, a little bit about species selection and some other things about, you know, propagation and um, some experimental things that I've been trying. So uh, that's sort of the talk, so the overview. First, I wanna talk about the growing locations because that's influenced sort of what I've been planting and how it's been growing. So I basically plant it anywhere I can, so public space, that means street sides, that means parking lots, that means, you know, uh, like the Ohlone Greenway in the yards of family and friends, both in Northern and Southern California. Um, so it's influenced by location and I'm gonna use the USDA zones as a convenience, but the heat and sun aspects matter a lot. Those things, are, I'm gonna try to introduce those, but ask me if you have questions. Um, and everything I'm gonna talk about is outdoor only. So some things I start in a greenhouse or in a, you know, on a heat mat inside, but almost everything I move outside almost immediately. Um, and that's mostly because greenhouses can replicate any microclimate with enough work. So it's not super interesting to talk about it. But the other reason is that it just takes more work in a greenhouse. You have to maintain the right temperature and humidity and everything needs slightly different conditions. It's hard to do that in a greenhouse. And so outdoors means lower maintenance for me. Um, and also it's a little fun to try to create the microclimates that you want in an outdoor context using trees and other trees to actually create microclimates for each other. So just a quick thing of all the growing locations that I'm sort of influenced by and in a sort of reference as I go through. So this started going north to south. So this is El Cerrito, Albany, Berkeley, um, San Francisco, Concord, and San Jose. So we have sort of a span of zone a 9B to 10B. Um, we have uh, you know everything from San Francisco, 
um, Mission District, which, you know, was somewhat foggy and windy, very low heat, no frost. Same with the Berkeley downtown rooftop where I had a container garden on a very large rooftop. There, the lows were 39 degrees every winter. So no frost, but extremely windy um, because it was exposed to the bay. Um, and then you have it through the other extreme, Concord and San Jose, where, you know, it gets very hot in the summer. There's some amount of frost, something like 10 days of frost a year, um, very hot, uh, dry conditions. Um, and then um, a little bit more sort of Northern California, Sunnyvale is like a little bit of the both worlds. Um, uh, Aptos, where my parents are, is coastal, um, minimal frost, a little bit, um, and foggy. Uh, they're just up the coast from Ellen and Freddie, but they get much less frost um, than Ellen and Freddie do. Um, and then, then the Southern California locations have grown in. So LA um, is sort of a long story behind this, but uh, there's a pocket of zone 11A in LA. There's really kind of two-ish pockets that I could find from the data. Um, and so I was growing in one of those. Um, and so that means, you know, lows no lower than 40 each winter um, on average. And so, so it was sandstone, very loose soils, very hot and dry, um, you know, things grew fast there. Um, and then several locations in Irvine from basically the coast to inland, and then San Juan Capistrano, which is just south of that, which actually gets some amount of frost because it's in a valley location. So those are sort of the locations I grew, grew in. Um, so that's sort of a wide range of zones, so 9B through 11A across California. And then if you think in sort of growing degree days, heat terms, uh, you have Aptos on one end, which is you know, about 2,500 growing degree days. Not a lot of heat. You don't get a lot of growth each year to about 6,500 in the LA location um, and sort of, you know, everything in between, as you'd expect. I don't have any experience with anything in zone 9A or colder. Um, I have some, you know, I've read about it, but I don't have any personal experience. Um, about half of the stuff I've grown has been in the ground and about half has been in containers. A lot of the slow going tropicals, like I mentioned, they're still in containers just because they're going to take a long time to go. I don't want to put them in the ground somewhere um, and not know if they're going to make it. So the species. So here's the full species list we're going to cover today. Well, it seems crazy yeah. um, and I'm going to group it and hopefully it'll make sense but please stop me. Probably a good place to ask questions might be, you know, you don't have to ask questions but at each family, you know, we can stop for a second and if anybody has questions in the chat, Andy can let me know. So not included among these species are about 50 more species, citrus, temperate fruits, uh, so apples, pears, stone fruit, et cetera, um, and also annuals, um, mostly because I don't really know anything special about them. I mean, I've grown them, but I don't you know, know too much about them and I haven't focused on them. Um, and also not included, I'm not a great photographer. I often, when I'm in the garden, my hands are messy. I don't grab my phone and take pictures. I've tried to include as many pictures as I could, but really I had to scour the last 10 years of photos to try to figure out which photos to include. So some things I don't have photos for, some things I do. Um, you know, I tried not to include photos from elsewhere because you can just Google for those if you want to. All right, so we're gonna launch into the species and the, and the, the families and species. Um, in the kiwi family, I'm only gonna talk about one because it's really the only subtropical one. And even then it probably survives in some temperate locations as a golden kiwi. You see this a lot at stores now. Um, you know, it's relatively frost hard. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, I've also grown normal kiwi and also the hardy kiwis, um, Arguda and Colonicta. Um, propagation, you can grow them from seeds, cutting and grafting. It seems what experience was with them. They never fruited. I didn't put that much effort into them. They seem very picky about water and humidity. Um, I found often that it either needs too much or too little water getting that balance right, especially in a lot of the cases I was doing in containers, didn't work out too well. I've seen them go better in the ground. I think maybe large containers even aren't gonna be sufficient. And there are also uh, many trellises and a male and female to fruit. So this one I don't have too much to say about, but I wanted to mention it just, just for completeness. And that's the only one in this family. All right, now we get into the, the main family. Now this, this is one of, the ones that I've really put a lot of time into, even though there aren't that many species here. So first is mapring. Uh, so mapring is native to tropical Southeast Asia. Uh, you can propagate from seed, though I've only grafted it on mango roots. Um, my understanding is less cold hardy than mango, but I've never exposed it to, to below two degrees. So I don't know 
how much less cold hardy it is, but it's everything I've read and also it seems to behave, seems similar to mango. Um, now the fruit uh, seems that it's also similar to mango. Um, I've tried one in Hawaii. I don't know if it was sort of representative or not. Um, mine haven't fruited yet. Um, and they're much smaller, thin skinned, um, sort of like a rich mango flavor. Um, the thing that I think is interesting about it, should you have a frost free and sort of high heat location in Northern California is one of the challenges with mangoes is that they just take a lot of heat to ripen. These are much smaller. They may give you an advantage in terms of, terms of ripening before the season ends. And so it might be worth trying in a frost free location in Northern California on mango rootstock. Mm. So mangoes. So propagation, I've done this from seed and grafted. Um, it can be multi root stocked. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, now the needs that you really have for mangoes, you want no frost or almost no frost. It can take sometimes, you know, 30 degrees. Below that, it's really kind of a failure. You may, may remember there was this so-called uh, hardy, cold, cold tolerant mangoes that have been going around. I know a bunch of you probably bought some. I bought some because I thought, hey, why not? I didn't have any good luck with that. I planted it in locations that didn't go down as low as it was supposed to handle. It didn't make any difference. I've kind of come to the conclusion that there isn't, there isn't any consistently cold tolerant mango out there. There are some cultivars that seem a little bit more, more cold tolerant. Um, generally the uh, sort of uh, Southeast Asian mangoes and that sort of, uh, I don't know what to call it, a, a subgroup of mangoes seem to be slightly more, more cold tolerant, but there, there doesn't seem to be any hard data on it. It turns out that the Laverne mangoes that are sold at you know, Home Depot and Lowe's and stuff, the, what they call the manila mango, but it's actually not a manila, it's just a seed, uh, seedling variety. Um, that is, seems to be pretty cold tolerant as you can get. And it's a pretty good uh, tree to start with as a rootstock if you don't want to grow your own. You can also grow from uh, the, uh, the Atualfo mangoes that they have at the grocery store. Those are fine. Uh, Kent, Keat, all those seem to do well. The one thing that people, uh, both Northern and Southern California have found, Florida grown mangoes, not the, not the scions, but the rootstock, tend to not do well here. And we haven't quite figured out exactly why, sort of community-wide, people haven't quite nailed down why that is. It seems to be a combination of the, the rootstocks they select in Florida, plus the fact that they've been in containers a long time, tend to mean that they get very poor growth once, once they go on the ground in California. So generally, while it seems appealing to buy a mango tree online, I'd recommend not doing that because it's not going to grow well for you. Better thing to do is grow it directly in the ground. And we'll talk about direct seeding later, but direct seed the mango seed, give it a small sort of almost mini greenhouse to get that seedling started early in the season and then get it up to size. And then if you need to in your location, protect it over the winter just to get it through its first winter. The next winter, it's going to be uh, next winter it's going to be big enough that it'll be okay um, you usually need to have days with highs above 80 degrees to grow otherwise you'll get almost no growth over the year so an example of this is i planted a couple of mangoes on the street side in berkeley berkeley almost never gets above 80 degrees i mean you'll get maybe five days a year somewhere in that range above 80 and so you would get maybe you know one uh one sort of uh, spurt of growth for maybe two weeks and then that would be it. And so you'd get maybe six inches a year, um, but it didn't die because it didn't get cold enough to, to kill the tree. Um, eventually somebody stole the tree, somebody dug it up and took it. And actually that happened to a bunch of the trees. Um, but the, uh, so the nighttime lows, um, if you want the grafts to be successful, you need it to be above 65 degrees. Um, it just turns out that the grafts don't push um, if it's below 65 at night. Um, and then typically if it's 65 at night, it's gonna be over 80 during the day. Um, so the fruit, a very wide range of flavors. Um, there are a lot of really great new Florida cultivars. Um, you got the classic mango flavors, you have the sort of Southeast Asian flavors. Um, there's the citrusy ones, there's the piney Indian type ones. There are very tart ones, there are coconut flavor ones. There's one called guava, which I really like to type, try, which supposedly has a guava flavor. So really you have mangoes that emulate all the different fruits that are out there. Um, I've grown a few mangoes um, here in Southern California at relative's house, um, not that many. Um, and, you know, I have a bunch of grafted trees, some of which have fruit on them right now in large containers. I'm not gonna let them produce more than one fruit each just because they'll probably 
uh, sort of strain themselves if you let them produce too much fruit. Um, and these are a range of some of the, the cultivars that I'm growing or have grown. Um, I tried uh, Inamarcara at Diablo Valley College in Concord, and I think it was probably the best bet for that location. It's a high heat location. It was a protected location. Unfortunately, the graft died over the winter. Um, I wasn't able to protect it. Uh, the tree didn't die, at least when that, that winter cold had hit. I don't know if it's still alive now. So a small fruited variety that can ripen before the season ends is probably your best bet in Northern California. Um, there are people who have fruited mangoes um, in Santa Clara, in Vallejo, in Fremont, um, and probably many other sort of uh, protected locations, you know, either surrounded by concrete or, you know, with enough cold air drainage. Um, there, you can definitely do it. I'd suggest doing it in the ground with one that you grew straight in the ground and grafted. So, um, the scions grow well from the terminal buds. So you want to get a, you know, they'll grow from the side buds too, but the terminal bud, you get good pushing like this one here. Um, cleft veneer and whip grafts work, um, all work well. Um, Multi-grafting is possible. This one on the right here has two. You can see there's sort of a lower graft and an upper graft. Um, it's in a container. Um, and then multi-root stocking is possible as well. And so by multi-root stocking, I mean this right here. So you'll see on the left that the, uh, there are two rootstocks, two mango rootstocks, and one scion grafted on it, and then this is the tree. And so what's going on there is this uh, thing that's uh, been talked about a lot on sort of Tropical Fruit Forum and other various places, and is apparently done commercially in India, which is that you take two scions, you bundle them together, or you take, you take two rootstocks, you bundle them together, so you can see sort of I tied them together before the, the graft happened, then you cut them at the same time, and then you just do a single uh, normal cleft graft with a sort of a double width scion into two smaller rootstocks. Now, the reason to do this is that you sort of get faster growth. You get the, the strength of the two rootstocks. It seems like that wouldn't necessarily work because they might be competing with each other, but it does seem to, to help the growth. The one problem that it has, and this is true not only in mango, but in avocado, is it somewhat dwarfs the tree, at least in my experience, the trees end up being a little bit shorter, the inner node spacing is smaller, and it tends to make them more precocious, they start flowering younger. Huh. And with mangoes, you don't really want that. If they start flowering younger, especially in California, they're putting their energy into flowering before they're really ready to produce fruit because the tree isn't big enough to support it. And so then you have to keep you know, cutting off the flowers, but you can't cut the flowers off because it'll reflower. You have to wait till it actually sets tiny little pea-sized fruits and then cut them off. So it's a little bit more work. So, you know, if you're going to do a double rootstock graft like this, I'd say grow it in a protected environment until it gets big enough so it doesn't induce flowering, and then plant it outside. It's just something to consider. Or you can grow the two rootstocks much higher and then graft it um, at sort of a higher uh, graft point, or grow a single rootstock and then do an approach graft of a sec second rootstock later on. Those are all different ways to get a second rootstock on. All right, so that's mangoes. Now we'll move on to marula, but uh, I'll take questions on mango in just a second after I finish marula, because that's the last one um, in the mango family. So marula is native to the subtropics and tropics in Africa, and it's an interesting fruit. Um, the uh, propagation is from seed. The seeds are rock hard. They look like um, they look like a nut, like a Brazil nut almost, um, and they're extremely hard. I mean, you can hit them with a hammer and they'll just bounce around. Um, and the way to germinate them is you can either soak them and then sow them, and then they take one to two years for germination. I had given up on them. And then all of a sudden I see all these things popping out of a container that I had forgotten about, and it was the marula. Then later I realized that maybe I should just whittle them down. So there are a lot of people who talk about you can whittle them down in various ways and pop out the seed eyes. So you need to use a very sharp knife and some woodworking tools and then scrape it, scrape down the wood, pop out the little seed eyes, and then the, the roots will come pop out. Um, and so they need heat and no frost. They tend to, they seem to be much more sensitive than mango to heat, uh, a lack of heat um, or uh, any even tiny bit of frost. They do come back from it as long as the frost was brief. Um, they seem to be semi-deciduous, at least in my experience. If they have any water stress, they lose their leaves and then they'll pop, their leaves will come out again, sort of like white sapote will do. Um, the fruit, um, I have not gotten fruit yet from these. Supposedly it's semi-sour. It's used in South Africa to make a liqueur. 
Um, and there are lots of sort of rumors that elephants like to eat them. A lot of like uh, wildlife really like to eat them. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very productive tree, a very large tree when it's fully mature. Um, they apparently did some selection work in South Africa. I talked to some researchers there to try and find cultivars of it. Apparently some orchards were planted out of these cultivars and then all of the data was lost because whoever was doing the project gave up on it or uh, lost funding or something like that. So um, there aren't really any known cultivars out there, at least that I could find. All right, so let me stop there. Any questions on the mango family before I keep going on? Looks like we did have a few questions, okay. like any prognostication on time from, let's say a direct seeded mango to flower, if it should uh, survive and succeed? Yeah, so it depends on whether you graft and when you graft. Um, if you direct seed and then you don't graft, um, in Southern California, it's probably somewhere in the four year range to get your first fruit um, in a sort of medium to high heat area like, you know, Orange County, um, LA. So, you know, about four years, plus or minus a couple of years, depends on the seed length. Um, and you can get a fairly large tree that way. And the biggest trees in Southern California that I've seen are the ones that actually were never grafted. Um, mm -hmm. and they can be quite big trees. Um, if you graft, often they will try to fruit almost immediately. The next year they will start flowering. And sometimes they will start flowering with two leaves on the, on the uh, you know, that little stick that you grafted on. It's kind of absurd. And yeah. so you don't want that to happen. And yeah. so, you know, there aren't that many good ways to avoid it. Um, what I've seen is the best approach is you basically give it as warm of an environment as possible, um, especially in the winter. And then it will tend not to try to flower over and over again. Um, it seems to, the cold seems to trigger flowering. One, one question I had was uh, not just for this uh, set of plants that you've already talked about, but mm -hmm. even the, the future one, and I, I imagine other people will have this question too, is how did you go about acquiring your source material? Yes, so I... If, if you can remember. <laughs> yeah, so I have mostly either got traded seeds, bought seeds, um, traded scions, bought scions. It's been just that process. Um, and it's... Sometimes it's people I know, and then it's sort of, it's one of these things where you talk to somebody and they say where they got this something, so then you talk to that person. Um, for mangoes, it's fairly easy now. There are a lot of farms in, in Florida that will just sell scions, so you just go and order scions from them, and they have huge collections. There is a little bit of a problem that there's mac, uh, mango bacterial black spot, which is a disease that's spreading through mangoes in Florida. That is a problem because pretty much every grove there is going to have it. And that means that when you get science, you got to be careful, or maybe there's no way to be careful. I don't know. And so, you know, there's these kinds of disease trade offs. Um, there's generally people believe that those diseases have gotten to California, so maybe there's nothing to do. So, mango science, you can order them. You can also get them from USDA. USDA the USDA station in Miami has the collection of mangoes. They will give you science. The problem is that they don't have many of the good new cultivars. They have all the old classic cultivars. Um, you can get some of the ones, like I, I got Ida Marcara from them because they were, you know, it's an older cultivar. Um, it's not one that people tend to commercially grow just because it's, it's a small fruited variety that they don't see the point in growing, um, but it's good for us. And so, um, so you can go to USDA. Um, later on, I'll talk about star fruit. I got my star fruit science from USDA in Hawaii. Um, so you can order from USDA for some things. Um, for seeds, I've gone, everywhere. I mean, sometimes I'll just see people posting on forums that they grew something and I'll send them a message and say, you know, hey, I'll, you know, especially for people say in Florida, they don't have good white sapotes, they don't have good avocados often compared to what we have. We can trade, um, you know, avocado and white sapote for mango and, you know, other tropicals. And so, you know, there's that kind of thing. And then sometimes it's even, you know, I was emailing with somebody who was in Argentina, who then told me about somebody he knows in Colombia, and that guy in Colombia has a farm outside of the city that he grows some interesting things. And later I'll talk about, talk about um, some highland South American pasifloras and um, bean families, so Chacha Fruto. There, I had just been emailing with this, with, with this farmer there, and he said he'll send me some seeds and I'll send him some seeds. And so we exchanged seeds and he's growing white sapote now, and I tried to grow some of the stuff he sent me. So, you know, it's a little bit of everything. 
And then of course, through the CRFG sort of community, you know, many of the people probably on this call. Awesome. How are we doing on time? It's, I'm seeing 8.30. Maybe we okay. should well, hold. I'll just keep going. Maybe we should hold most questions to the end and. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so Chair Moyes, uh, so the Nonas. Um, Chair Moyes are pretty widely known in the community. I think many of you probably have more experience growing them than me, so I don't want to sort of opine about them too much. Um, so they're native to Highland, Central South America. Um, I've grown them from seed and grafted. I don't know if you can grow them other ways, but those are the ways I've been growing them. Um, they seem to do best with minimal frost, no hot or dry winds, and I tend to do better, they tend to do better with sun protection on hot days or placed in a location where they don't get the afternoon sun. Um, they, the fruit is, you know, very sweet, creamy, often very seedy, and you have different uh, cultivars with sort of a lemony or berry or custardy flavors. Um, I've only gotten a very little amount of fruit from my trees. Um, I've gotten some from ones I've planted you know, for my family and friends, but not on my own sort of in pot trees, and I don't want to let them fruit. Um, they have been flowering, but I haven't let them fruit. Um, and it requires hand pollination for good fruit set. Um, this is something that I think is a downside for Cherimoya, but um, it seems like a tree that should be widely grown in Northern California because it'll work for almost all of the sort of chapters that we're talking about. Um, one thing that's really interesting is that the new buds emerge below the existing leaves. And so often you get this sort of everything drops in spring and then pushes new growth and they sort of push the leaves out as they grow. Um, and the one thing that I got thrown off when I originally started grafting this, and maybe all of you are familiar with, is the new growth is brown. And so when you have little buds that are growing out of your, of your parafilm that are brown, it looks like it's dead. And so it, it's tempting to think, okay, my graft failed. But with Cherimoyas, I always just let it go for a very long time because sometimes it grows a little slower, the buds come out, they're still brown, but then it, it does end up growing. And then it, you know, it's green. And it's just because the, the new growth is brown. Now there's another uh, option for sort of dealing with the uh, hand pollination issue. And so some San Diego folks um, have uh, bred a cherimoya crossed with an atomoya. So an atomoya is a cherimoya crossed with a sugar apple. And then you take that atomoya and then you back cross with the cherimoya. So you get sort of three quarters cherimoya, one quarter sugar apple. And so it has most of the properties of a cherimoya, but it seems to not require hand pollination. The leaves are a little tougher. Um, and it seems to be slower growing, at least for me. Um, and I, so I haven't gotten any fruit yet on it. Um, but this might be a promising direction to go in to avoid the hand pollination issue. And so, for example, on one of my uh, relatives' trees, um, I grew a cherimoya seedling, grew up to, I don't know, about six feet. And then I grafted the very top of it with a scion from this. So that way, the top of the tree, which is going to be hard to hand pollinate, it's going to be um, this is an idea from a San Diego uh, CRFG member. Um, and so that way you don't have to reach up to the, the sort of upper parts of the tree to hand pollinate. Yeah. And so, you know, that might be a nice way to go. Um, Ilama is an interesting one. This is a sort of tropical lowland anona. Uh, the propagation from seed and grafted, the seeds seem to require gibberellic acid. I got very low yield on it. Um, it seems like a lot of people had a same, have had the same problem with it. Um, it does grow very slowly for me. Um, it seems like people have pretty good luck crafting it. I just haven't bothered crafting it. Um, it needs a lot of heat. People who have successfully fruited this in Southern California have been in inland Orange County or inland LA. So very hot uh, sort of zone 10B locations. Um, and supposedly the flavor is sort of a raspberry cake flavor, which sounds kind of appealing. So. I know at some point, I think I'll try, try grafting this. I just haven't yet. So Rolinia. Rolinia, you may have seen some pictures of Rolinia. I think I may have seen it on um, the Monterey Bay CRG page. Um, so it's native to tropical lowlands. Um, from seed uh, and grafted work both, uh, both ways. I've grafted it on Cherimoya rootstock. I don't know what the long-term compatibility is, but it seems like it's OK. Um, it seems to want zero frost and it wants a humid environment. Um, and I've had the fruit in Hawaii and the fruits are very large and have this really nice lemon cream flavor. They're not overwhelmingly sweet the way cherimoya is, 
which is why I actually liked it. It's the sort of thing which you can eat more of, and it's also not as seedy as cherimoya. So um, it's sort of a more pleasant fruit to, to the process of eating it is more pleasant than a cherimoya. All right, so that's the anonas. Um, there's also papa, but I'm sort of leaving that out as it's a temperate. All right, so this is sort of an oddball, oddball one, but yerba mate. So I don't know if you all know yerba mate, you've probably seen the teas. Um, it's actually very easy to grow. It's in the holly family. Um, propagation from seed or cuttings. Um, seeds are supposedly hard to start. I never tried starting them from seed, it's just from cuttings. Um, and it needs substantial water, at least in my experience, but otherwise it seems pretty tough. It doesn't, it doesn't have any problems. I did get weird spontaneous branch dieback every once in a while, um, but other than that, it was easy to grow. It's non-fruiting. Um, you just take the leaves and you make mate, yerba mate tea from it. And so it's, it just has caffeine. Um, so, you know, if you want to, instead of buying, you know, yerba mate that's been flown in from South America, you can just grow your own. It's pretty easy. All right. So now we go to the one and only palm tree that I'm going to include, which is Chilean wine palm. Um, there are other uh, subtropical palms. I just didn't include any of them, so I'm not growing any of them. Um, and so Chilean wine palm, uh, propagated from seed, needs sun, but otherwise it's tolerant. Um, I haven't gotten any fruit. It seems that it takes many, many years for it to start producing fruits. Um, it produces miniature coconuts. You'll probably see them all over the Bay Area. Um, and I think they're pretty tasty fruit. Um, they are a pain to crack open. Um, but, uh, you know, if you do manage to crack them open, if you use a macadamia nut cracker, it actually works pretty well. Um, and it's a very stately tree when it's mature. Um, it's supposedly also uh, relatively frost tolerant. So, you know, I have mine in 15 gallon pots. Um, they're just slowly, you know, putting out a leaf every several months, very slow, but, you know, I don't have to pay attention to them. All right. Now this is another one quick oddball, which is stevia. Um, so you probably see stevia sweetener everywhere. It's very easy to, to grow from seed and cuttings. Um, it seems to need substantial water, otherwise it's tolerant. Um, and it's not fruiting, it just used the leaves to use it as a sweetener. Um, it's actually really easy. You just pick the leaves and you grind them up and you put them in, or you just crush them up and put them in whatever you're drinking. Um, one of the things about it is that the sweetener that they sell at the store, I think is concentrated at stevia or stevia. So it's uh, much sweeter than the leaves are. Um, so it's actually, you know, it's a kind of nice thing to use because you can have a little more control over how much sweetness you get from it. All right. Now the only bromeliad I grow is pineapple. Um, there's a lot of bromeliads out there, a lot of ornamental ones and some relatives of pineapple that are supposedly edible, but um, I, don't, I haven't tried any, any of those. So pineapple is really worth growing. Um, it's also great because you can grow it in a container. Um, and so propagation, you can propagate it from pups and offshoots and fruit tops. Grocery store fruit tops are fine. Um, you need to give it a, no, a zero frost environment and you don't want to overwater it, but otherwise it's pretty tolerant. Um, you can kind of treat it like a desert plant. I mean, not completely, but um, it, that's fine. You can also water it from the top so you can water the leaves. You can foliar feed it if you want to. Um, it doesn't have a big root system. Um, the two cultivars I'm growing are the white uh, white core varieties, so the Kona sugar loaf and the white jade. Kona sugar loaf a, has a lot of spines on it, white jade doesn't, otherwise they're very similar. And so it's easy to fruit in a large 15 gallon container. Here's mine right now, my white jade, that's uh, the fruit is, I don't know, about six inches tall, um, doing fine. Um, you get about one fruit per plant. It can refruit, um, but I've usually just uh, repotted it and taken all the slips, as many slips as I can off of it. Um, the, like I said, the spine free varieties like white jade are really nice. And the, the fruit flavor is much better than what you get in a store-bought variety. So it's very worth growing. And the nice thing is that if you're in a place that does get frost, but you only get, you know, five days of frost a year, you can just bring in the 15 gallon pot into your garage for those five days and then you'll be fine. All right, so cactus. So the cactus family, there's three that I'm growing. Um, Peruvian apple cactus. Um, so this, you can grow from seed and cuttings. I've never grown it from seed, I've just grown it from cuttings. Um, and it uh, seems to be tolerant of a wide range of conditions. Um, I'm not too so much of an expert on Peruvian apple cactus. The fruit seems very similar to dragon fruit, um, fluffy and mild. Um, I've kind of liked it. 
Uh, I'm not a huge fan of dragon fruit or Peruvian apple cactus. They're, they're fine as fruits, but you know, I don't go out of my way to grow lots of them. Um, they seem to be easy to grow. I believe that it may benefit from hand pollination at night. I haven't really tried doing that. Dragon fruit too. So dragon fruit is pretty popular. Um, you can grow it from seed. I've tried growing it from seed and that's very slow because the seeds are so tiny. Um, cuttings also um, are pretty easy to root. Basically every time you have one of these little constrictions, you can just you know, cut it right there, put that in the soil, you'll get, it'll root itself quite easily. You can also just allow it to flop over into some soil and it'll root itself and then you can just cut it off, sort of like ground layering. Um, it seems to want no frost, but otherwise it's quite widely tolerant. I, I think the one that I show here is sort of leaning against a wall. I didn't give it anything to trellis on. It seems to have sent its roots into the stucco and just kind of glued itself to the wall. Um, and it, it tends to also survive for a long time, even without water, as you might expect with a, with a cactus, but it also benefits from a good amount of water. So, you know, you can overwater it, you can underwater it, it seems to be fine as long as it doesn't have frost. Um, it does seem to want a trellis to really fruit properly. Um, so, you know, you probably need to give it that um, if you want substantial fruit and hand pollinate. And finally, prickly pear. Everybody knows prickly pear grows all over wild in California. Um, you can again grow from seed. That's really slow as I've found. Um, cuttings are probably your better bet. So basically you just take one of these pads and grow it. Um, it seems to be widely tolerant. The good ones are juicy and watermelon-like. There are some folks that have been trying to find all of the wild ones that have been growing all over California and selecting them. Um, I'd like to try some of the sort of really good varieties, but you know, even the ones that are sort of more popularly in circulation um, like Ken Litchfield's variety, you know, pretty good watermelon-like flavor. Um, I really hate dealing with the spines and the prickles. Um, it's just, it's a little bit of a hassle. Some people use a blowtorch. There's all sorts of methods people have come up with for removing the spines, or, you know, there's the rollers that they use commercially. Um, so that sort of dissuades me from growing a lot of it, um, but it's, a, it's an easy sort of no-hassle fruit. All right, so now we get into papayas, the papaya family. So papayas are an interesting one to try in Northern California. Here's one that was growing on my uh, Berkeley rooftop garden. Um, you can grow it from seed quite easily. Um, you'll get you know, good results just from a store-bought fruit or from uh, you know, any, really any papaya, you're gonna get good results from the seed. Um, usually you wanna grow a, a variety that's gonna have um, more self-fertile uh, trees. So um, the Hawaiian cultivars, the solo, um, solo strawberry papaya, um, sunrise, sunset, th those ones all um, are more self-fertile. I think they're also tastier, they're smaller, but they're also less cold hardy, at least from, from what I've seen. Um, you can also graft them. I'll talk about that later. It's a little weird to graft papayas, but it is possible. Um, and they need no frost and no cold water logging. And the cold water logging is the really tough thing to do in Northern California. When we get those heavy, uh, heavy downpours, cold storm, and then you get a following night that's like, you know, 30 degrees, and you get a clear night with tons of water, you know, sort of drenching the soil, papayas hate it. And even in a container, a well-drained container, they still struggle. They, their leaves go yellow, they drop their leaves, and then once that happens, it's really hard to revive them. They do great in, in Southern California. The, the one that I planted at a relative's place in Irvine is just pumping out fruit um, and it survives the winter just fine because they don't get enough rain that it really gets waterlogged. The, the winters are warm enough, the soil never gets too cold. It really seems to be about a soil temperature issue. Um, and this may be the reason that a zone 9B in Florida can grow papayas and a zone 10A or even 10B in Northern California has a hard time because their frosts are really brief, their soil doesn't get cold. And so the temp air temperature might drop, it'll defoliate, the soil temperature never goes down. And then the next morning, the temperature's back up to 70 and the, it sort of starts recovering again. Whereas we don't get that kind of dynamic, it really struggles under the cold winters. Um, it's also a very short lived tree, so you know, if you plant it in the ground, expect to be replanting. Um, babaco is an interesting one, so it's a hybrid. Um, I don't know what the actual sort of official species is, but it's thought to be some 
wild mountain papaya papaya hybrid. Um, it's been propagated by cutting. Um, it doesn't take frost too well or excessive heat, but otherwise it it's very productive. It produces cr crazy amounts of fruit, very juicy, pretty bland. Sometimes there's sort of a hint of like a melon flavor, but usually it's just like a big juicy papaya. You can just bite straight into it. Um, you can eat the skin too. Um, and it's relatively short lived. Um, now it's related to mountain papaya. Mountain papaya, you've probably seen them around the Bay Area. Um, they will also produce a ton of fruit. They, they can handle a tiny bit of frost, but generally they don't like frost. They don't like excessive heat. I haven't liked the fruit generally. They're musky and bland. Um, and they're very pro productive though. And so one thing that I've tried is papaya grafting, which is grafting papaya onto mountain papaya. Um, I haven't done this in a long time. I did this at Diablo Valley College uh, years ago. And this was to try to get the root hardiness of mountain papaya. And so starting from seed, you grow the mountain papaya and the papaya. Um, papaya doesn't branch, so that's kind of why um, I started both from seeds. And then just snip the top off your, your papaya um, and off your mountain papaya. Do not wrap with parafilm because it's hard to wrap the cyan, uh, the, the papaya cyan, without damaging the buds. And also they don't seem to push through the parafilm very well. Um, and a cleft graft is fine and then secure the graft union um, with parafilm and then give it sort of a plastic bag or put it in a mist house and then provide bottom heat. Um, with this you'll actually get the papaya uh, to push and um, grow just fine. It actually did seem to grow faster um, on mountain papaya rootstock than on its own, but I never got to plant them in the ground to confirm root hardiness. So I'd love to hear if somebody tries. Okay, now we're moving on to the mangosteen family. So mangosteens are an interesting family because they're sort of split into these two pseudo families, the Garcinias, uh, these are the Asian and African mangosteens. These are the ones that are the famous ones, the purple mangosteen. Um, and uh, then there's the, what used to be called Redia, but has now been merged into Garcinia. This is sort of the American, sort of Central and South American mangosteens. Um, they're graft compatible, um, but they have very different hardiness and sort of very different growth habits. Um, the Asian and African mangosteens, especially the Asian mangosteens, seem not worth trying here. They're just too tropical. Um, even in Florida, in South Florida, they are, they are not able to grow um, the, you know, the normal you know, purple mangosteen. Um, they're very slow growing here in California, but they do find in containers, and so I'm just going to let all of mine grow and see how they do. Um, I tried seashore mangosteen, which is supposed to be a slightly more hardy um, Asian mangosteen. Even that didn't work. So among the South American mangosteens, um, Achate Ru is a famous one. Um, you can grow from seed or graft it. It wants a no-frost environment with moderate warmth. Um, it has It's a small fruit with an orange skin, white pulp, a sweet tropical citrusy taste, and a single seed. Mine, again, haven't fruited yet. Um, I've had it in Hawaii. It's a commercial fruit in Australia under the brand Achacha, um, and they have huge uh, orchards of Achacha root growing in, I think, in Queensland. Um, I think it's probably too tropical to be grown outdoors in Northern California. Um, Mexican Garcinia, on the other hand, is this interesting species, which some of you may have heard of, that was discovered, at least sort of popularly discovered, in the last decade in the hills of Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Um, and this one is interesting. It may be actually recently discovered an even highland species of this Mexican Garcinia. It's kind of unknown. Um, and you can graft them. It grafts fine. Also from seed, most of mine I've been growing, growing from seed. It seems to take some amount of frost, not very much, but a little bit. And it doesn't need much warmth to be fine. Um, the fruit is actually like a large achacheru, so a bigger one, um, kind of a lemony, citrusy, uh, sweet flavor. Um, and it seems to be extremely tough. It's not a family that I expected to have any tough trees, but it seems to be a very tough tree. There have been Mexican Garcinias that I have left in a pot unwatered for three months, four months, something like that. And it would seem totally fine, completely unaffected by it. Um, I don't know how that is, but it, it just seems to be a very tough plant. Um, there is supposedly this, this lowland type may be, um, the lowland type is already sort of hardy, like zone 10A, no problem. The highland type may be even zone 9B hardy, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so this is what they look like. They have these really big 
glossy green leaves, um, which are kind of purplish yellow when they emerge. Um, and then other garcinias, there's a bunch of others. Um, I've propagated them all from seed. Um, most of the seed has come from Hawaii, some from Puerto Rico. Um, and the uh, Garcinia intermedia, so it was a lemon drop mangosteen, it's like a small achache roux. It didn't seem to be cold tolerant for me, so I gave up on it. Imbe is an interesting one. This is an African mangosteen um, that's supposedly like achache roux, but a little bit more sour. Um, it may be more cold tolerant, at least as a rootstock. So there's evidence from someone in San Diego who's using imbe as a rootstock for the Mexican Garcinia because imbe actually imparts better growth for Mexican Garcinia. Um, and then finally, there's one called Street Sweet Madroño. Um, this is supposed to be a similar, sweeter achache roux. Um, this also was not cold tolerant for me, and so I stopped growing it. And so here are just, you know, just so you see what they look like. This imbe on the left here is two years old from seed. And you can see how small it is. It's maybe six inches tall, and each of those leaves is maybe three inches. These are very slow growing. On the right here, you see a cherry mangosteen. This one, I think, is my last one. All the others have died. Um, and so the cherry mangosteen, lemon drop mangosteen are sort of interchangeable names for them. All right, so the ebony family. Um, I'm only going to talk about two here. I mean, persimmon is the famous one. Um, but this is a weird one that I've been growing for a while. No idea what's going to happen with it, but I thought I'd mention it. It's called gold apple. Um, it's from tropical Southeast Asia. Apparently, it's grown at temples for some reason because maybe it's medicinal, is what it's rumored to be. Um, it uh, seems to want a no frost condition, warm and hot sort of weather, but otherwise, it seems to be pretty tolerant of uh, neglect. Um, it's very slow growing. The one that you see in the background is about three, uh, three feet tall and I've had it for, I've been growing it for seven years, I think. So it takes a long time. I don't know. Maybe it needs to be in the ground somewhere. Um, black sapote. People talk about black sapote. This is a sort of overrated fruit, I think. Um, the sort of sales pitch for black sapote is often that, you know, you have this awesome chocolate pudding like fruit, uh, very big, um, not too many seeds. The thing is, the fruit, at least the ones I've had in Hawaii, kind of mushy, kind of creamy, kind of oily, not a very strong chocolate flavor. Supposedly, the good ones have a sweet, mild chocolate flavor. Uh, Bernicker and, and uh, Rani Key are supposedly some of the good uh, cultivars. I haven't grown or tried those. Um, I gave up on growing this because it didn't seem worth it. It seems to want more heat than most places in Northern California have, to, at least to get good fruit. Um, but in the places that it does grow, um, it is extremely productive and it may be a good fruit to grow, especially if you're in a sort of uh, zone 10B kind of location that has some heat. All right, so now Eliagnus. So I'm only gonna talk about a couple of the Eliagnus uh, fruits that I'm growing. So Soshan is an interesting one. Uh, this one's from tropical Southeast Asia, as I understand it. Um, I've grown it from seed been growing for many years. It still hasn't fruited. I think I've had this one for, I don't know, five or six years, maybe longer. Um, it's about, it's in a 15 gallon pot and probably about five feet tall, something like that. Um, and the fruit is supposedly gumi-like. The tree itself is slightly thorny. Um, it's not true thorns, but basically the, the leaf buds sort of, sort of don't fully develop and they turn into thorns. Um, and, you know, we'll see how this one does. It, it also seems to die back um, if you don't keep, keep it, uh, you know, well watered. So that's a little bit of a hassle. Uh, Catherine Anderson's gumi. This one is an excellent uh, fruit that everyone could be growing. Um, so the species is unknown. Um, we don't know if it's a, a hybrid or if it is just, you know, a gumi that um, happens to be larger. It's like a grape-sized gumi. Um, and it has the sweet, complex, uh, slightly gritty flavor uh, and texture of a gumi. Um, it seems to be very tolerant to sort of Bay Area conditions. It, it just grows and grows and grows. It's very productive. Um, the seed is a little large, so it's hard to eat the seed versus the gumi. I just eat the gumi seeds. Like the Catherine's gumi seeds are a little larger because the fruit is larger, so it's a little bit harder to eat the seeds, but you can still eat them. Um, and then propagation from cutting, it takes very easily from cutting. And so now we're going to move on oops, to one just sort of oddity along the way. 
for a little while, I was seeing in the Bay Area some nurseries carrying Chilean wineberry. Um, so I thought, okay, you know, I'll, I'll grow some Chilean wineberry. Let's see how it does. Um, propagated from seed. Uh, it needs substantial water, at least from what I found. The fruit supposedly blueberry-like. You need a male and female. I found this to be a very finicky plant, and I, I usually give up on really finicky plants just because I end up having too many plants, and so any one plant that takes too much time, I end up giving up on. And so I've given up on the Chilean wineberry. If somebody you know later in this Q&A has some opinions on it, I'd love to hear. Maybe it's a really great fruit, and so I should try growing it again. All right, Fabaceae. So the bean family. So there's a lot of viable options for um, uh, the bean family. And I think everybody should grow at least one of these. So we have straight, straight from uh, sort of zone 9B options, you have carob and guamuchil. You have a uh, sort of zone 10A option, which is ice cream bean. And then you have some 10B options, chacha fruto and tamarind. So carob is widely grown. Everybody is familiar with carob. Um, I think it's important to get a good cultivar. I was looking to try and find a source for them and I don't know where to get good cultivars, but getting seeds for them is trivial. If there's a lot of trees around, just start them from seed. Um, getting ice cream bean seeds is also easy. Um, in Southern California, it's very easy because several of the, um, the you know, horticulture departments said, um, for example, um, Fullerton, they grow a giant ice cream bean tree. You can get seeds from there. Um, the ice cream bean on the Ohlone Greenway is now fruiting. That sh should have seeds soon. So there are sources for seeds. Um, Guamuchil is more of a desert tree. It's probably going to do better in something like Concord or San Jose rather than Santa Cruz or San Francisco. Um, it's very thorny, it likes desert conditions. It grows crazy in those sort of conditions. Um, and among these, I only know of ice cream bean as actually being a nitrogen fixer. I don't know if the other ones are. Chacha fruto is supposedly, I just don't have my own evidence for that. So carob, uh, propagation from seed. Um, it seems to like warm, dry conditions. Um, like I mentioned, the quality varies by cultivar and you can find them all over. Chacha fruto is an interesting one. This one's um, been pushed as a really productive bean, uh, bean tree. Um, it's supposed to produce huge amounts of, of yield, um, supposedly like large lima beans once you cook them. Um, and I tried growing it. I got, so these are seeds I got from Columbia. Um, the, it seems to want zero frost. It doesn't like cold, wet soils. I planted it on a lonely greenway and my trees died. And that was the end of the chacha fruto experiment. Um, it's extremely, extremely thorny to, it was such a hassle to handle. Um, so you know, it was still interesting, so I thought I'd grow it. Um, so I grew it a couple years in the greenhouse, planted it outside, and then they died. So it'd be worth trying again, especially in Southern California. Ice cream bean is easy to grow. I know probably many of you are growing ice cream beans. Um, it, it wants minimal frost. It's pretty tough otherwise. Um, it's a nitrogen fixer, especially if you inoculate it. You definitely will get fixation. I'll show that in a second. Um, it grows very fast. Inga spectabilis, the machete ice cream bean, which is a very large fruited one, is, has the one that's done the best for me. Um, I've also grown Inga edulis, and that one grows well. I thought maybe to get some more cold tolerance, I'd try and grow the Uruguayan ice cream bean, so I got that one. Um, the seeds are very small. It grew very, very slowly, and it didn't seem worth it. It also didn't seem to have any more cold tolerance, maybe because it wasn't vigorous. Um, and then guamuchil. Guamuchil is kind of an interesting one. It grows in hot, dry conditions. Um, it actually doesn't like it when you water it and sort of pamper it. It does better when you just sort of neglect it and leave it in a hot, dry location. I've seen it growing wild uh, in the sort of leeward dry side of the Big Island in Hawaii. Um, the fruit pods are kind of interesting. They're kind of a curved tamarind shape uh, pod, um, pink and green. They have sort of a sour ice cream bean flavor inside. Um, and it seems to grow well in some cold areas and you know, grows well in Arizona, for example. And then tamarind. You can grow this from seed. For some reason, the seeds of the store tamarinds don't seem to grow. I don't know if they're either too old or they've been irradiated or something like that. Um, it seems like you have to get seed from somewhere else, not the store fruit. Um, it likes hot, dry conditions, but it has to be frost-free. It's not fussy otherwise. It doesn't seem to grow very fast, though. Um, and the tamarind trees that I've seen, even in Hawaii, don't seem to be giant trees like guamuchil or ice cream bean. Um, the pods um, 
you probably have some pods or you've seen them. So you get either the sweet type or the sour type. The sour type is very, very sour. The sweet type can be quite sweet. Um, and it seems like it grows fine outside in California, but I don't know about the fruit. So just quick thing about uh, root nodules. You'll see here, this is an ice cream bean that I ripped up. Um, you'll see that there are all these root nodules on there. Um, so definitely sort of confirm nitrogen fixing in this ice cream bean. Um, here's the ice cream bean fruiting on the Loney Greenway. You'll see those sort of brown lines in the middle. Those are uh, bean pods. Um, and it sort of has this sort of flag leaf shape. And then tamarind grows, it, it has these nice sort of uh, rounded uh, paired leaves and they tend to close up um, when the tree is sort of sad. I haven't quite figured out what triggers the closing and opening, but it seems like when they're drying out, they also close. We're being asked, how do you eat ice cream bean? What's that experience like? Yeah, so to eat ice cream bean, um, you just pop it right open. Often it'll start popping open on its own when it's mature. Um, and then you just sort of scrape the bean, uh, the, the pulp out. And different cultivars and our different species seem to have different amounts of pulp. Some of them have a ton of pulp and then you can kind of pull the pulp out directly. Some of them, the pulp is pretty meager and it's stuck to the seed. And then you just have to pop the seeds in your mouth and sort of scrape the pulp off with your teeth. Once you get into that sort of uh, situation, it's almost not worth it. So the, that's why the machete ice cream bean at least feels like it's worth it because it's a big enough pod and you get enough that it makes it worth uh, growing and eating. There are supposedly a couple of species of ice cream beans or the Inga uh, genus that are edible if you cook them. Um, but I have not found seeds of those uh, species yet. And so I'm still looking for them. Cool. All right, so this is one just quick uh, oddball. This one called Jamaican mint. I only started growing this maybe about two years ago. Um, it's an interesting uh, sort of bush-like mint. It grows from cuttings. Um, it wants some warm frost-free conditions, but otherwise not fussy. You can grow it in the shade. Um, it doesn't fruit. Its leaves taste like mint. Um, it's basically all there is to it. It's a sort of a tropical mint. The thing that's nice about it is that it kind of becomes a bush form rather than sort of a low growing uh, plant like mint is. And it has a slightly different mint flavor, but I don't know how to really characterize it compared to the other mints. All right, so the laurel family. Now, there is, of course, avocado, which I'll briefly mention, but, you know, Ellen and Freddie have said far more than I'd ever be able to say about it. So I'll only briefly touch on avocado. Um, cinnamon is in the laurel family. Um, and so here's a salon cinnamon that I'm growing. Um, you can grow it from seed. Uh, it needs warm, frost-free conditions, but otherwise it seems not fussy. It just grows just fine. Um, maybe it produces fruit. I've never seen mine fruit. Maybe it's not old enough. Um, uh, the cinnamon bark um, is what you're after, and the leaves smell like cinnamon too. It seems to do well in the shade, at least, you know, it'll grow in the shade, and since I'm not growing it for fruit, it doesn't really matter to me. Eventually, I think it'll be big enough that I'll start harvesting its bark, but Right now, only small part of the bark of this tree is actually sort of hardened enough that I think it would be even worth trying. Avocado. So don't think there's too much for me to say about avocado since that was the uh, uh, talk last time. Um, so, you know, the only thing that I guess I would say that I've found is that um, direct seeding is a good idea. Um, my, my bad experience with avocados has been mostly by um, planting avocados that have been in pots. Um, they seem to, the root systems just don't like being in pots, um, even for a little while. Um, and so if you can direct seed, you're, you're better off. Um, so you want a really big seed when you direct seed, and you want one that's vigorous. And so Zutano has been a really good go-to. It seems to be popularly used in the sort of commercial nurser nurseries anyway. Um, it's multi-grafting is viable on avocados, so you, you can single or multi-graft the direct seeded avocado sort of at year one or year two, whenever you feel like it. You can also multi-root stock avocados like I showed with mango before. The interesting thing, the reason I tried this was that um, you probably know of the, the Kona Charwell uh, avocado. I found that Kona Charwell is a really slow grower for me in Northern California. And I thought, okay, let me see if I can push the growth faster. And it also seemed to not be fruiting. So I multi-root stocked it. So I did a double root stock graft. Um, 
and it was one bacon seedling and one Zutano seedling. And I tied them together and grafted it. And in the next year, it put on lots of growth, but with very short internode spacing. So it was very, very bunched up dense growth. Um, and at about two feet tall, it started flowering. Um, and I'd never seen it either have that form or to try to fl the Kona Sharwell flower that young. Um, so multi root stocking seems to have a, a, an interesting sort of uh, effect on the precocity of the tree. The other people who have tried multi root stocking since then um, that I've talked to um, have said that they actually get better pr production on their trees. Um, so you can have a backyard tree that's sort of six feet tall that is producing way, way more than a normal six foot tall tree would. And there's a wide range of cultivars that I've tried growing. I can talk about them later if anyone has any questions. But like I said, Ellen and Freddie have covered the avocados way more than I'm going to. Um, and then Coyo is an interesting one. So there's a relative of avocado um, called Coyo or Chukte. Um, this is a very rare um, sort of central Mexican uh, species. It grows in the highlands. The fruit is supposedly similar to avocado. Um, I haven't tried it myself. Um, and it apparently either has a slightly coconutty flavor or a slightly oniony flavor, like guacamole kind of flavor. The fruit is apparently quite good, like a good avocado, but the seed is large, so you don't get as much pulp. Um, that might just be a matter of selection that we need to select good varieties. Um, it's graft compatible with avocado. I had grafted it on a tree on Ohlone Greenway and also um, at a tree at a 7-Eleven parking lot in Berkeley. Um, both of my trees that I planted and they both, um, one of them got chopped off by a gardener, the other one got eaten by a deer. So now I'm back to no koyo. I have a bunch of seeds now that I'm about to start again from uh, someone in Hawaii. We'll see how that goes. So um, there's also supposedly root rot resistant UCLA when it had the UC uh, avocado collection a long time ago, uh, grew koyo and attempted to use it as a root rot resistant rootstock. I don't have any data on how that worked, but um, it may be possible. All right, and I'm only gonna mention pomegranate briefly, but I think I saw Marta on here. So really my, this slide should say, go read what Marta has written about pomegranates. Um, so the propagation from cutting and seed, I've done both, they're both easy to do. Um, it's obviously frost hardy, likes heat, it's drought tolerant. Um, the only thing I wanted to say really is that I don't think that the white seeded cultivars like Eversweet are worth it. Um, you probably see them, you think maybe I should try out one of these in my sort of cool coastal climate. It's just not a very good fruit. I mean, it will be slightly sweet, but it has very little flavor. Um, so I've mostly enjoyed the ones that I've grown in like San Jose, for example. Um, so Parfianca, Wonderful, Desert Bee, and, and Sogdiana are the ones that I've grown and have enjoyed, but I really want to try the ones that Marta has been writing about. All right, and then one more sort of oddity that you probably see uh, talked about quite a bit is acerola or Barbados cherry. Um, this one has been talked about a lot because it's supposedly high in vitamin C. So are a lot of things, but this one has got a lot of press for being high in vitamin C. You can find superfood acerola tablets and all sorts of weird acerola powder, things like that out there. Um, if you grow it, it's uh, very drought tolerant. It likes heat, minimal frost, you can pretty much ignore it and it'll do fine. Apparently it is also uh, tolerant of high salt and high pH, which is sort of unique among um, a lot of these subtropicals and tropicals. But even the sweet cultivars, this one's called Manoa Sweet, um, it's just not that sweet. So, I mean, it's understandable because it's high in vitamin C, but it's not that sour either. It's just bland. Um, and so it's not a particularly exciting fruit to grow, um, but you know, if you want to try it out and it's, it's not that hard to grow. All right, cacao and kuposu. So these ones are, you know, famed trees. Um, cacao is an amazing fruit, um, not, not just because of the chocolate, but I'd recommend if you have a chance, get a cacao pod, a fresh cacao pod, crack it open and eat the pulp. Um, you should brush your teeth afterwards because the pulp is intensely sweet, intensely sour, and it's so acidic that I think it's probably just stripping the enamel off my teeth when I eat it. Um, but it's really hard to stop because it's such tasty. It's like a intense sort of sweet and sour fruit candy flavor. Um, it's a large pod with pulp and seeds. 
Um, I grew uh, several cacao trees in greenhouse environments in Kukwosu, um, grew them quite big. I'm told that they will fruit in a greenhouse environment just fine, but I didn't want to just grow in greenhouses. And so I had this, I got to a point where I had to choose grow in a greenhouse or move it outside. And I just gave up on it because it wasn't going to grow outside. I haven't heard of anyone successfully fruiting it even in Southern California. It seems to need too much humidity. It needs sort of protection from the dry winds. It doesn't like temperatures below 45 degrees, so on. So it's just a tricky tree to grow in California. Maybe still worth growing in a greenhouse. Kupuasu is sort of a more sour and a little bit more rare uh, relative uh, of cacao. All right, and then just a couple of uh, uh, in the neem family. So uh, neem you've probably seen and used um, as a uh, pesticide, uh, sort of a natural pesticide, and you can grow it just fine. It's a little bit fussy. Um, I grew it from seed. Apparently you can grow it from cuttings. I haven't tried. Um, and it seems to want tropical conditions. It really likes heat. Um, you, mostly it's used medicinally, so you, for both sort of human medicinal use and also in the garden. Um, I've been growing it outside in Southern California, but it's really fussy. I get sort of die back in the winter, even when there's no frost. I get slow growth. Um, get leaves sort of withering for no reason. So it's just a, seems to be fussy in our conditions. It may be in a better sort of microclimate in Southern California do better, but I just didn't think it, would work. it was worth it. Santal is another one that is supposed to be really interesting tropical. Um, you know, I talked to somebody who's from Thailand who uh, grew up eating these both sweet and sour types. The sweet types are supposed to have a lemon candy-like pulp um, sticks to the seed. I tried growing this in Southern California. I gave up on due, uh, due to very, very slow growth and it died back in the winter. Um, so it seems like this one's going to be a tough one even in Southern California. All right, so the fig jackfruit family. So jackfruit. So I've tried two different species of jackfruit. So uh, uh, just normal jackfruit and also what's called wild jack. Um, wild jack is a species that grows in the, the mountains between, uh, in, in southern India between uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu. And the, um, you can propagate it from seed or grafting. Um, it wants minimal frost. It wants a lot of heat. Um, and there's a lot of cultivars out there all over the world. Some are sweet, some are chewy, some with and without latex, some are long, some are big, you know, it's all different shapes. It can, the largest fruit in the world can be up to 100 pounds. Um, seeing one hanging from a tree is just an impressive sight to see such a massive fruit just hanging right over you. Um, this is not a container tree by any means. Um, it grows well in fruits outdoors in California. I've seen several of them. Um, I have not tried a Southern California grown uh, jackfruit. Um, there aren't that many th that I think are gr at that level to be fruiting in Southern California, but there are more and more each day, each year. Um, seedlings seem to grow well when direct seeded. Um, I had good luck direct seeding them in LA. Um, wild Jack is smaller fruited. I got actually more faster growth with Wild Jack than I did with uh, jackfruit. It may be a good rootstock for jackfruit. Um, I don't know about the fruit. My understanding is Wild Jack tends to grow to something like the height of 50 or 60 feet before it fruits, which is crazy. So I think that may not be a great option. Um, Quimuk is another interesting one. Quimuk is a, um, a more subtropical relative of jackfruit. Supposedly, it has sort of a fig mulberry flavor. It's about the size of a fig. It's growing well for me in Southern California in containers. Um, I think one of them may be flowering, but I think I'm not sure about that. So it's supposed to take quite a while for it to start fruiting. Um, I'm doing an experiment where I've grafted jackfruit onto Quimuk rootstock to see if I can impart hardiness because it's subtropical. Um, it does not seem to be doing great on Quimuk rootstock. And that may be because Quimuk is less vigorous than jackfruit. I'm not sure. Fig, everybody knows about fig here. I'm not gonna say much. The only thing I wanted to say is that grafting figs is actually a thing that's worth trying and it can impart uh, vigor for varieties like Black Majera that's uh, not very uh, vigorous. Um, this was inspired by Harvey's suggestion that you can grow Black Majera and other rootstocks. So this one's grafted on panache, uh, which is a much more vigorous uh, fig variety. And so it seems to be growing a little bit faster than normal black majera, but not that much faster. It is fruiting fine, so you know there's no graph compatibility issues or anything like that. 
Um, the one trick with grafting figs and also with jackfruit, because it has so much latex, you don't want the latex coming out the top when you cut the, uh, cut the rootstock. So the way to avoid that is you sort of nick the, the rootstock below your graft union before you start grafting. Then you cut so that you sort of have an outlet for the, the sap to come out the side before it gets to the top. And then you can graft the top and then you sort of, you wrap both of the, the nick and the graft union at the same time. Um, mulberry. So, you know, lots of folks probably growing mulberries. Um, I think it's something that everyone should really grow. Um, easy to, to grow Pakistan mulberry from cutting. Um, there's also another one that's called Himalayan mulberry, which people have been growing. That one, like uh, Persian mulberry, seems to need to be grafted. Um, you can also grow it from seed, but I haven't tried doing that. Um, it seems to generally just grow everywhere with no problems. I haven't seen any problems with, with mulberries. Um, you can get mealybugs, I guess, sometimes, but other than that, it's fine. You get a sweet, complex berry flavor. The trees are very productive, and they're also graft-compatible with non-fruiting mulberries. I've grafted them on non-fruiting mulberries, and they do great. All right, one quick stop on Moringa, and then we'll keep going. So Moringa is the drumstick tree. You've probably seen Moringa as another one of these sort of superfood, you know, leaf extracts, leaf powder, um, and also the, the drumstick itself sold. Um, you can grow it from cutting or from seed. I've done both. Um, it wants a very warm growing season, um, zero frost and no water logging. It's sort of like papaya in that way. And so it does not seem to like Northern California. I know of people who can grow it in a container and then bring it into the garage for the winter and then they take it out in the summer again. Um, you can use the pod and drumsticks for cooking um, and you can use the leaves. That's not too much more to say about Moringa. Um, I gave my plants away to some other folks I know here in Southern California because they actually like the, the drumsticks more than I do. And so they're growing them in their yard and they're doing fine. And then another sort of uh, isolated uh, family. This one I really think is a great fruit, even though it's extremely tiny, as you can see in the picture. This is called a Jamaican cherry. Um, and so that tiny little uh, reddish purple fruit you see there is uh, Jamaican cherry. You can grow it quite easily from cuttings. Um, I was propagating a ton of them at DVC. I think DVC still has the mother tree and is probably still propagating it. It has extremely tiny seeds inside of that tiny fruit. Um, and it tastes like cotton candy. I mean, it really tastes exactly like sweet cotton candy. And so it's like a little burst of flavor in that tiny little red cherry. Um, it needs a very warm condition, zero frost and minimal wind. And it can be very fussy during cold winter weather. You'll lose a lot of leaves. As long as you can prevent it from actually getting true frost, um, the trunk will survive and it'll, it'll push new growth in the, in the spring. Now, bananas. I've grown a lot of different types of bananas, um, and I think bananas are also one that could be widely grown um, across Northern California. You propagate from pups that come out from the, you know, right next to the main trunk. Um, when you cut out a pup, you need to make sure that you get some amount of the, the white rhizome underneath. Otherwise, you'll get something that looks like a banana plant, but then it won't actually have any root system, and then it'll die back. Um, you just need minimal frost or no frost. Um, lots of water um, and some amount of potassium from some source to get it to actually set fruit and hold fruit. Um, that potassium could be in the form of banana peels, by the way. Um, so the fruit, you have a wide range of flavors and types. These are the my favorite cultivars um, that I've tried or I'm growing or both. Um, and I'm growing all of these, but I haven't tried every single one of them, but I've tried most of them. And um, let me just show you some of them because that's real. Everybody knows about bananas. So this is a bunch of dwarf Brazilians that I grew and, and harvested in Irvine last year. Um, this, I don't know exactly how heavy it was, but I'd say it's somewhere in the 60 pound range um, for this, this bunch. Um, and that was a year and a half to fruit and pretty much gave it no extra fertilizer. Um, and yeah, so it's doing great. Um, this is my street side bananas that I grew in Berkeley. You can see that in the middle picture, um, we're talking about eight square feet of dirt. And this is like terrible urban compacted soil that was filled with, it was too compacted even for weeds to really grow. So there was like two inch tall bits of dead grass growing from it when I started growing the bananas there. Um, and just with coffee grounds um, 
and banana peels. Uh, we got to this point in about two years with two two full pseudo stems producing two uh, bunches, and um, so yeah, it's it's definitely possible. But one thing that this location had as an advantage is it had that heat sink of all that concrete. It was south facing, and it was in the Elmwood neighborhood, which tends to not get too much frost. So let's move on to Mertaceae. Now this is a, a family I've grown a ton of species. Uh, you can see this list of species that I can talk about. I'm going to try and group them because it's going to be too hard to actually go into all of them. Um, you could propagate them from seed, ground layering, grafting. Cuttings are generally difficult, but it's possible. Um, they, they have this weird drought tolerant property like figs, and maybe some of you have seen this, where people talk about figs as being drought tolerant and guavas as being drought tolerant. Real what quick, I think I interrupt you, Broth. We're yes. getting two, two people asking about how you apply your coffee grounds and banana peel. Okay, I'll talk about that later if that's okay, okay. Um, because I will get to it. Um, so so uh, the thing about these sort of drought tolerant species, guavas and figs for what I've seen, they're not really drought tolerant, they're just extremely thirsty and aggressive. And so they're constantly sending their roots out, but if they're in soil that is completely dry or they're in a container, they die back fast. And so that's what I've tended to see with guava and all of this sort of guava, Mertaceae in general. There's a wide range, pineapple guava, a lot of you know it, I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, um, but everyone should be growing it. It grows great from seed. I don't think it's necessary to be hunting down the sort of named cultivars. Just get a good seed from a good tasting fruit, grow it and you'll get good fruit. Um, wait for them to drop and scour you know, the landscaping. There's, they're planted widely as landscaping. A lot of the good pineapple guavas I've eaten have just been dropped by a landscaping bush somewhere. Campomanasia, so this is sort of a little weird oddity. It's tiny blueberry-like fruit. People have talked about growing it. Basically, the sort of bottom line is it's not really worth growing. It's a very small, sharp clove flavor with a mild guava flavor. Uh, Gromichama, this one's an interesting one. It's in the sort of group of sort of tropical cherry-like fruits. Um, it seems to want minimal frost and some sun protection. Here is one of mine that's in sort of a large container. Um, it has really nice glossy leaves. It's a very ornamental tree. Mine haven't fruited yet. I've had the purple type in Hawaii and it's a nice fruit, um, sort of cherry-like, I guess you could say. Um, the yellow one is supposed to be sweeter. I'm growing both. We'll see how they fruit soon. There's a uh, cherry of the Rio Grande and dwarf cherry of the Rio Grande. This one may be misclassified. Nobody's quite sure. Mine has been flowering. I don't know if it's gonna fruit soon. Um, it seems to need plenty of water, but it's supposedly drought and heat tolerant, so I'm not totally sure about it. And it's supposedly cherry-like. That's pretty much all I have to say on this one. Really, the I'll talk more about cherry of the Rio Grande in a second. Um, there's another one that's called rainforest plum, uh, Eugenia candeliana. That, this one is supposed to be a relatively large plum-like fruit that's sort of a tropical plum-like fruit. This one has been a pain to grow. I tried growing it in Northern California, Southern California, it grows fine, then it dies back, it grows fine, it dies back. So I've given up on this one. If somebody has had success with it, I'd love to hear about it. Cherry of the Rio Grande. Now this one grows very easily. This one's uh, it's supposed to be quite frost tolerant. It's actually named, as I understand it, for Rio Grande from Brazil, not the river Rio Grande. Um, and the propagation from seed and grafting. I've grafted, so mine is actually a seedling where I have one of the sort of two main trunks of it. Uh, of the seedling variety, and then one of the, the trunks is grafted to Ben Poirier's Ben's Butte cultivar, which produces a fruit that is remarkably, it's almost identical in size and flavor to a Bing cherry. It's really amazing how close it is to a Bing cherry. Um, and the seedlings are highly variable. I've had some bad ones, so, you know, it's worth grafting a good variety on if you're going to grow it. Um, the fruit develops remarkably quickly from flower to ripe in about a month. Um, it can supposedly flower multiple times per year and fruit multiple times per year. Mine flowers, but it doesn't seem to set fruit multiple times per year. I'm not sure if there's a pollination issue or what's going on. I do get some fruit, but not. it's only moderately productive. Patenga tuba is another um, relative. Um, this one is constantly flowering for me. Um, it produces these sort of yellow fruits that look like miniature star fruits. They are very sour, but very fragrant, and they have this really great aroma, but the sourness is just mouth puckering. They're probably like large cherry sized or maybe like golf ball sized, it sort of varies. Um, 
it seems to be not fussy at all. You can just sort of neglect it and it grows great. Um, I recently grafted a couple of sticks just because I thought maybe it's a pollination issue and this one doesn't have a nearby cross pollinator. Suriname cherry. Um, Suriname cherry is an excellent fruit. I think should be grown widely in Northern California. Um, you can grow it from seed or grafting. The seedling varieties tend to be a little bit musky and sometimes don't fruit very well. Um, it's not fussy, it needs moderate water. It can take a little bit of frost, uh, but not too much frost. The best varieties have a really complex sweet cherry flavor. I think they're better than cherries and they are more productive than, than cherries because you get the sort of multiple flowerings per year. One of mine on a tiny stick has been putting out, uh, I don't know, 10 Suriname cherries a week on probably a branch that's about 12 inches long. Um, it's a really productive, uh, productive tree. Um, and that's just because that branch is just one stick that I grafted. Um, so the common varieties are interesting. It has this curry leaf mixed with swear, sweet cherry flavor. I never tasted that in any other fruit. Um, there's another variety called Dazi Blasta, which is, comes from way southern uh, Brazil and Argentina. Um, supposedly, it's more cold, more cold tolerant. I haven't been able to test the cold tolerance. The flavor of my fruit was mediocre. It didn't have any off flavors. It didn't have the, cherry, the curry leaf flavor, but it was very bland. So here's one. This one's a black star cultivar. It puts out a lot of growth. It grows really well. Um, other Eugenias, there's a bunch of other species. Eugenia florida, there's dwarf gremichama, there's potomba, sweet uvaya, Eugenia rapanda. Um, these all sort of have similar growth patterns, very slow. Um, they don't seem to want frost, but otherwise they, they don't have any problems. We'll see how they do. Um, I'm growing all these. If somebody has successfully fruited any of these, I'd like to know. Most of these, I've been growing them for about five, six years at this point, and they're all still, you know, a couple of feet tall. So it's taking some time. I fruited Potomba one time, has some apricot flavor. Um, I'm not growing that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. It didn't seem worth it. It was a little bit fussy. So here are some of the, the sort of, this is the general sort of look. You get the sort of peeling bark look, and uh, a lot of them are TCA. Um, so here are some of those. Um, Sweet Uvaya, Yucca Panda, and the Dwarf Gromichama. Um, Guabiju is uh, another unrelated, so it's not in the, uh, among the Eugenias. This one is a nice fruit. It's blueberry-like fruit. It's relatively frost tolerant. It wants moderate water, um, probably moderate to high water needs, but other than that, it's not fussy. Um, you can grow it from seed. Um, it has these very sharp, pointy leaves. Um, it's kind of a nice ornamental tree as well. And then the jabata cabas. Um, none of mine have been fruiting. Um, I've eaten plenty of jabata cabas in Hawaii. They're really nice fruits. Um, grow them from seed. They need moderate water, minimal frost. Um, it's worth planting. Jabata cabas is the kind of thing where you want to start it now. You want to see really you wanted to start it 10 years ago. It's one of those because it's slow growing and they take a long time to start fruiting and they're coliferous so they produce their fruit directly on the trunk, which is really nice. Um, there's a bunch of varieties, the white, uh, Sabara, Coronata, Pithanthra, Grimal, Escarlate, and who knows, lots of others. Grimal seems to be the one that grows best for me. Nobody knows entirely what the species of it is. So here's Grimal jabaticaba. There's a lizard hanging out on a, a stake that's uh, sitting right in front of the Grimal jabaticaba. All right, strawberry guava. So this one that a lot of people know. Everyone should be growing it. It's really easy to grow. Um, well, I guess not if you're in Hawaii because it's invasive, but in California, uh, definitely grow it. Um, it's not fussy. The fruit is sort of large blueberry sized fruit or small cherry size, sweet tart kind of flavor. I don't quite taste the strawberry in it usually, but it has a little bit of a strawberry hint. It's very productive. It's easy to grow from seed, um, so you might as well just grow from seed. Lemon guava is kind of like a upgraded, better strawberry guava. I kind of prefer it. Um, because you get slightly larger fruits, kind of like small, medium, plum-sized in best case, um, and it's a little bit sweeter. Um, it's just as productive. Um, I think it tastes quite similar to a true guava, um, like a slightly less sweet true guava. I'm growing this mystery wild species from Madeira Island called Madeira guava is what I'm calling it. Um, I got seed from somebody in Madeira, and a, supposedly it tastes like a cross between passion fruit and guava. Um, it seems to want minimal frost, otherwise it's not fussy. 
Um, my tree is very big now. Um, it's still in a 15 gallon and it's, you know, it's over the fence line, as you can see by a good bit. Um, and it's still not uh, fruiting. So I don't know what this is gonna actually taste like, but I'm, I'm hopeful about it. And so I'll let you know when I do. And then of course, true guavas. Um, they grow well in Northern California. You can grow them in a frost-free location. They, they're known to need heat, but you don't actually need heat. I grew them in Berkeley and they fruited. The fruits were small, but they tasted like guavas. They were a little bit sour compared to a, you know, an Irvine grown guava. These ones down below are Irvine grown guavas. They're extremely sweet and, and tasty. Um, the problem, of course, that you run into with guava trees is that the rodents take all of them. So that, you know, that's a separate problem. Rose apple also is extremely easy to grow in Northern California. Very nice glossy leaves, has kind of a mild rose water flavor. Um, there are a lot of uh, relatives of rose apple, the sort of lily pilly trees that are all over the place. I've wanted to try grafting uh, rose apple or wax apple onto the lily pilly uh, <laughs> trees, but I've never actually tried doing it. I'm curious if anybody has. And then Chilean guava. This is another one that everyone can easily grow and should grow. It grows well in the shade not fussy. Uh, Chilean guavas, or you know, known as Agni, um, have this intense strawberry flavor, at least to me, uh, kind of blueberry-sized fruits. Um, there's a relative of it called black Chilean guava, which I used to grow, um, and it uh, has sort of a mix of Agni strawberry flavor with a clove flavor. Um, a lot of Mertaceae seem to have a kind of clove flavor to them. Um, and it was growing and very productive for a while. I left it out in the hot sun and the it completely just scorched. Um, and this was not even that hot of a day. It was like a hundred degree day in, in uh, Southern California. So, you know, these are not, do not like being in the sun. And then a bunch of other species. These are ones I'm not, not going to even have time to talk about and I don't have too much to say other than I've been growing them. They seem to not be dead yet. And other than that, I don't have too much to say about these, but you know, I'm happy to come back to them um, if anybody's curious about any of these species. All right, olive, just for completeness, I'm mentioning that I'm growing olive. So literally almost nothing else to say except that you can grow them in mild summer climates. They do okay. They don't have to be only grown in the Central Valley. Um, so there's a lot written elsewhere. So that's just all I'm gonna say about olive. Starfruit. Now, starfruit's the only one in this family I'm growing. I was considering growing Belimbi, which is a relative of starfruit, but it doesn't seem to be that promising of a fruit, so there's no point. Starfruit, you can grow from seed, you need to graft because the seedling varieties often don't produce edible fruit or at least not very good fruit. And unripe fruit, bad fruit, green parts can be toxic, they're high in oxalic acid. So even on a ripe starfruit, if they have green ribs, you're, it's better to cut the green ribs off because you get rid of that oxalic acid. Um, it seems like it will shape fruit in even part shade. Um, my tree seems to be um, setting fruit right now. It's not, it's been struggling. It's been producing a ton of flowers, um, but finally the bees have found it and now it seems like it's setting fruit. Um, I've been hand pollinating before that. The fruit, fruit is very sweet, juicy, refreshing. I mean, I wouldn't say intensely sweet. It's sort of a nice, like a uh, sort of juice kind of sweetness and um, sort of an Asian pear flavor if you haven't tried it. Um, so here's my star fruit tree. This one is uh, the Sri Kembagan variety. Um, flowering intensely. It's been flowering for a couple of months at this point, so I think it really wants to fruit. We'll see what happens. All right, Passiflora's. Here is a whirlwind. We've been growing a lot of Passiflora's. Um, so I'm not going to go through every single species in detail. Um, you can group them by what they call the Passiflora supersection. So these are three of the supersections I've been growing. The Taxonias, these prefer these are sort of very highland tropical varieties. So they prefer sort of San Francisco-like climate is the way to think about it. Low heat, low frost or no frost, part shade, that's what they do best in. Then there's the Passiflora supersection. These are things like Edulis and others that are related to Edulis. These are adaptable, they're varied. They like moderate to high heat. They can handle a little frost sometimes. And then the Laurifolia supersection, these gen tend to be tropical. They like no frost. Some of them want high heat. Some of them want moderate heat. And I'll tell you, talk about those. And then there's a bunch of species and cultivars. Um, so the Taxonias, I've grown these four. Mission Dolores, which is a cross between Perite and Antioquensis. Um, it has good fruit. Um, 
it does not want frost or heat, and it likes shade. Um, just as an example, I killed this one on an 85 degree day in Berkeley, which you wouldn't expect would kill almost any plant, but it couldn't handle that. And so, um, you know, it's, it wants really San Francisco-like conditions. I mean, by the name, you can tell Mission Dolores. So um, Antio has grown well. Uh, Tom grew this in El Cerrito and I was growing it as well. Um, he grew it on a uh, north side of his house um, against the fence line in almost complete shade and it fruited really well for him. Um, it's not heat or frost tolerant um, and it doesn't want, um, it doesn't want like anything, almost any sunlight. Um, the banana passion fruit, Melissima, grows wild. You can see it sort of taking over places in San Francisco sometimes. I think the fruit is pretty lousy. Um, it's kind of musky flavored. It's very, very productive and it's moderately frost tolerant. And then Panata stipula is one that people have talked about as a sort of good uh, taxonia to grow. I grew it, the fruit was very small and not very tasty, so I just kind of didn't think it was worth growing anymore. Now among the edulous supersection, um, really, the focus should be on edulis. The other ones, Actinia and Incarnata, you know, for, for novelty's sake, maybe to grow them. But you have the purple passion fruits, which are the edulis. Um, excellent flavor. Pretty much any purple passion fruit is going to be fine. Some of them are slow growing, though. Then there's the Hawaiian lilikoi type, the yellow fruited passion fruits. Those are large. Some, some cultivars, even though that's known as a sour type, um, some of them are actually sweet. And I um, was recently, until I killed the plant a month ago, was growing a sweet Hawaiian lilikoi, and now I'm gonna to have to track down another one. Um, it's not self-fertile, and so uh, you need to cross-pollinate it. And then there's Frederick, the most common one that's sold everywhere. If you just need to grow a passion fruit, go get a Frederick. It's really easy and uh, it's a nice fruit. Um, the fruits drop when they're ready, so it's no point in picking them, and they sweeten up as they get more wrinkled in about a week. So here are some of the standard edulis purple passion fruits. Um, here is a flower from, and then a um, edulis flavocarpa. So this is the lilikoi, and then it turns yellow, and it's a larger fruit um, than a purple passion fruit. And then the laurifolia supersection. Um, I'm not going to go into all of these in detail. Um, there's sort of the alata and ruby glow uh, passion fruits. There's the Jamaican passion fruit, and then there's the highland, the ligularis, and then there's a bunch of relatives that. You know, I'm going to share these slides later so you can all read it if you're curious. Um, really, the ones that I've focused on are Alata and Laurifolia um, and Ligularis, so the top three. Um, the other ones haven't been, you know, ones I've grown over and over again just because it didn't seem worth it. So Ligularis has these big heart-shaped leaves. It likes to be in semi-shade. Um, I've gotten it to flower in Northern California. Somebody I gave plants to fruited it in his yard in San Diego. Um, somebody on the Golden Gate chapter was saying that he fruited it in San Francisco. So this seems to be totally viable uh, for sort of low frost conditions um, in all over California. Phoenicia, which is also sold as Ruby Glow, is a popular sort of ornamental that's sold, but it actually will fruit if you cross pollinate it. And that's what the flower looks like. It produces a large sort of lemons, lemon or even sort of orange sized fruit. Um, and it's a really nice fruit. Um, Nigridania is a uh, relative of Laurifolia. It flowers quite easily. I never cross-pollinated it, um, but I'm growing it again now. I, that, that one that you see there died, and then I um, propagated it again, and I'm growing it again, um, and then we'll see how it goes. Um, this is really the one that I'm most excited about. So I haven't yet run into anybody who has fruited this, and so I put a lot of effort into focusing on how do I fruit Laurifolia. This is called Jamaican passion fruit. It may be my favorite fruit of all the ones I'm going to talk about today. Um, so that's the flower there. It, you know, a lot of these uh, Laurifolia type flowers are really sort of frilly and ornate. Um, and the fruit is interesting. It's a very, it's like a soft lemon um, and it's kind of fuzzy on the outside. The fruit, the pulp inside is not sour, but it doesn't lack uh, from not having a sourness, whereas Ligularis is not sour, but it doesn't, it, the sweetness is somehow bland. Alorifolia has a floral nature to it and a little bit of citrusy hint, um, quite sweet. Um, it's a really nice fruit. Now that, you know, now I'm selling, uh, selling everybody on this awesome fruit. The problem is, of course, that it's extremely hard to flower um, and get it to fruit. 
Um, it takes multiple years for it to get to the point where it'll even flower. I, I talked to somebody who grows it commercially in Homestead, Florida, so at the very southern end of Florida, um, and she told me that there she grows it in containers um, because it seems to force it to fruit. So she grows it in big barrels. Um, and I don't know, I also ate it in Hawaii and um, it seems to, uh, in Hawaii, uh, fruit just fine on sort of the dry side of the island. So it doesn't need humid tropical conditions. Um, I've also tried grafting this on more hardy rootstock, um, but the one that I grew here is actually a seed that I brought I shouldn't say this, but I brought it through the ag inspection because they, they caught the fruit coming back from Hawaii in my bag. And so I put, I ate the fruit, put it in my mouth, went through the ag inspection, and then I spat it out into a plastic bag, brought the seeds back and planted them. And so that's six years later, this fruit. Um, Cross-pollinated it with edulis. All right, sugarcane. So this is the one grass I'm gonna talk about. Sugarcane is super easy to grow grow from cutting, you lay it flat. Um, in about a year, you'll get fruit or you'll, you'll get a cane that is edible. Um, the bottom of the cane is more edible, get, you know, gets less of a grass flavor, more of a sweet flavor. It doesn't absolutely need heat, but it really likes heat. And you need to give it tons of water and full sun. Um, and it'll just grow, grow, grow. It's extremely fast growing. All right, so the macadamia family. So there's an oddball, a uh, macadamia relative called Atherton oak, which is from, I think, uh, sort of New South Wales and Queensland, um, up in the mountains. And it's supposed to be more cold tolerant. Um, and so that's why I tried growing it. The seeds don't have a lot of, of um, sort of content to them. They're very small seeds, uh, you know, not a lot to eat. It didn't seem like it was really worthwhile. It was a slow grower. I gave up on growing it because there's a lot of good macadamias, but just thought I'd mention it in case somebody was curious trying it doesn't seem to be worth it. Macadamia, on the other hand, there's a lot written about it. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, except that they are very, very long-lived trees. It's worth just planting one and just growing it. Um, as an example of this, there's a macadamia that was planted in the late 1800s growing on the UC Berkeley campus, still there. Seems to be just neglected. It's growing in the shade of redwoods and oaks now that have overgrown um, the macadamia tree. Um, supposedly planted by Professor Dwinell, who was a biology professor that Dwinell Hall is named after. And it's right there at the Center Street entrance of campus. And so it's still producing plenty of macadamias. The squirrels are the only ones that seem to know that it's even there. All right, there's a couple of more oddballs, bird, plum, and raisin tree. Um, these ones I don't have too much to say about. Um, uh, the raisin tree option is a little bit more viable. The only thing to mention about these is that both of these fruits are known to have medicinal qualities. They may be worth growing. Um, they are not too hard to grow from what I could tell. Um, I grew both from from seed. They were quite vigorous. Bird plum seems to be more, more cold and tolerant. But other than that, um, I think I, I was growing these at Diablo Valley College and I ended up selling, they ended up in their plant sales, ended up selling all of them and that was fine because I wasn't going to keep them. All right, so loquats, not too much to say about loquats because I'm sure most of you are growing loquats or have loquats around. Um, the only thing I wanted to mention is that the sort of rumored grafting on quince rootstock thing really works. It dramatically dwarfs loquats. Uh, the loquats I've grafted on quince rootstock stay, you know, three, four feet tall. They, I mean, they'll probably eventually grow bigger, but they uh, really, it does dwarf them quite a bit. And they do flower at a very young age when you graft them on quince. The one problem with that is quince keeps sending up shoots since you have to keep picking off the quince growth. Um, but you know, you could probably just root that quince growth and you get more, more rootstock. So it's a win-win. I've tried some of the varieties that were from Japan that were sent to folks in Hawaii. Um, these are really good varieties. Um, I hope that we can somehow get some of the good Japanese loquat varieties uh, here somehow. Um, Catalina cherry. So this one's a wild cherry as I understand it. Um, I don't know where exactly in California it's native to, but I believe in Southern California, and I guess Catalina wow. Islands maybe. Um, it's, I've seen it growing around in the Berkeley area, and I just picked them and eat, ate them off the street side. And they're really good. I actually like them better, uh, at least the one that I found, better than uh, actual cherries like you know Bing or you know, some of the other varieties that are commercially available, and some of the non-commercially available ones too. Um, the problem is that the seed is large. Um, it's an evergreen tree. It also produces at a different time of year than 
uh, conventional cherries do. So you can kind of extend your cherry season. Um, and then capelin cherry. I kind of find these a little bit musky and sweet. I didn't really like them that much. And they also suffer from fruit flies. And so, I mean, cherries do suffer from fruit flies, but these particularly seem to. And so it didn't seem worth growing. But there are some cultivars that are in circulation. Maybe it's worth grafting and growing them. I just never did them. All right, and then one quick mention for coffee. Um, again, Marta can probably say more than I can on this. Um, I, before sort of getting some of the good varieties of coffee recently, um, I was growing coffee so many years ago in Berkeley and fruited it just fine in a container. Um, you, can, you can definitely fruit coffee in a container in Northern California and you could probably fruit it in the ground. Um, it just needs minimal frost and moderate sun protection. Um, but other than that, you're probably good to go. And then white sapote, everybody uh, is probably familiar with white sapote, not too much to say here. Um, the only thing I'd like to say is that the root systems are sensitive. You benefit from direct seeding, like I'd mentioned for avocado and mango. Um, and there are some good cultivars that seem to be in circulation in Southern California that don't seem to be common in Northern California, like Leroy might be worth getting. Um, and then also there's some Florida cultivars that are supposedly good like Redland um, and Youngin's Gold that I'd be curious to try. Uh, curry leaf is also Rutaceae um, and there's no fruit here. It's, you grow the leaf for a spice. Um, it doesn't want frost, but otherwise it's fine. It grows in part shade. You can grow it from seed pretty easily and it'll set fruit pretty easily. Um, the fruits taste like curry leaf, which is kind of interesting. And then you can plant the seed. Um, it can carry citrus greening disease without symptoms, as I understand it, um, which is why it's under the quarantine restriction. And so you should grow it from seed if you want. And then a couple of weird ones. So in the Sapindaceae, dune soapberry. So this is a supposedly similar to long in fruit um, and seems promising as a frost and drought hardy long in alternative. This is one that I'm growing. Um, and I'll, I think I have a picture of it later. And then there's longin itself. The Kohala longin is one that I think should be widely grown in California. It grows really well, seems somewhat frost tolerant. I planted it at DVC years ago. I hope it's fruiting now. I don't know how it's doing, but um, it seemed that it was growing really vigorously compared to the Sri Champu and other varieties I planted um, in the ground there in DVC. Um, it's juicy, sweet, grape-like. Um, it likes humidity and water, but it seems more drought tolerant than lychee. Um, and so it's an easier fruit than lychee. And then of course there's lychee. Lychee is just a kind of a hassle. Um, it's worth growing, but it really likes humidity and water. It doesn't want frost. It doesn't want wind. Um, Brewer and Sweetheart seem like the best options. I'd like to see if somebody has fruited it in Northern California. Um, I managed to fruit it in Irvine. Um, it seems like otherwise it's kind of a hassle. Um, I've tried grafting Nomycee, which is this, I probably messed up the pronunciation, um, which is supposedly a really good cultivar. I've grafted it on long and we'll see how the graft does over time um, because there is some, some amount of graft compatibility, but I don't know how much. And then one oddball, Guaya. The species is unknown and it's from the Yucatan um, and it's related to Spanish lime, which is uh, a sort of sweet and sour fruit with not very much pulp, but a very sort of sour uh, flavor. This one's supposed to be a little sweeter um, it likes humidity and water, but it's actually quite tough. It's related to lychee, but it's much tougher from what I've seen than lychee, um, other than it doesn't like frost. Um, mine's quite tall. This one I think is, I don't know, six feet tall or something like that, um, but it hasn't fruited yet. And then Sapotaceae. Um, you may have seen argan, um, you know, argan oil and argan, I guess, extracts of various types. It's native to Morocco. It grows easily from seed. It really grows like a desert tree. It's very spiny, very kind of gnarled. Um, uh, it seemed to better, do better with neglect. It doesn't like being transplanted. Um, I transplanted some of them and it really set them back. Two of the four that I transplanted died um, from transplanting. Um, so it seems like you wanna uh, be very careful in transplanting and you know put it in some hot, dry location and neglect it and see if you get some argon. Star apples. This is the one that I've always wanted to grow and have failed to grow, and I'm kind of sad about it, but that's the way it goes. So star apple uh, is excellent fruit. Um, 
very sweet and juicy like a milkshake. I've had a bunch of them in Hawaii and they're really, really nice fruits. Um, I've tried white star apple, pink star apple, purple star apple. All of them have failed to thrive or survive. They sometimes will grow for a little while in the summer. They want humidity, they want wind protection, they don't want cold, they don't want cold roots. They just seem too tropical. It might be possible. So my way of trying to get around it has been to grow uh, Chrysophyllum imperiale, which is a rare species that uh, was once growing in Brazil, but then got cut down in Brazil, apparently. Some of them got to sent to Australia. I got some seed from Australia. Um, it can grow in California. Um, it's very rare uh, in general, and I don't know about the fruit quality. Supposedly it's edible, but I don't know if it's any good, but I think it might be interesting to try as a rootstock. Um, and then there's the satin leaf, uh, which is growing fine in San Diego from what I've seen. I don't think the fruit itself is good though. So it might be a rootstock. Here's the seedlings of the Imperiale growing um, in sort of a group container. I'm gonna move them out later. And then Chico Sapote. This one, a lot of people talk about it and it can be fruited outdoors in, Cal in Northern California. This is one that I fruited in Berkeley, you can see right there. Uh, you could see this, this is a Silas Wood variety in the, the right hand picture, you can see the fruit developing in the middle. Um, the fruit wasn't particularly good. Um, this was a small tree, but I think it, that was sort of a proof that you can uh, you can grow it and produce a fruit. Um, so Alano and Silas Wood seem to be the ones that produce the best and grow the best in Northern California. Um, it seems to want zero frost. It seems to do better when you neglect it. Whenever I tried to pay attention to it and water it, and it always seemed to do worse. So I tended to just ignore it. Um, some people really like the fruit. I don't really like it that much, but I think I just don't like this Sapotaceae fruit. Um, other than star apple that much. Um, Abiu is another one I tried many times. I failed to grow this. Somebody, uh, if somebody succeeded in growing this in, outdoors in California, I'd love to hear it. Lucuma, this one um, should be grown widely. Um, it has very weird fruit. It's dry and dense. It has a cross between an egg yolk and a sweet potato kind of flavor. Um, it seems to be not fussy at all, very drought tolerant. Um, mine haven't fruited. I've planted some outdoors, so maybe the ones that I've planted that I haven't followed up on have fruited, I'm not sure. Um, and it seems to, even when it dies back from frost, like this one died back from frost last year um, because it's, uh, the location I had it was, was frost, had a couple days of frost. It dried, died back all the way to the ground and then it grew back really quick. Miracle fruit is also Sapotaceae. People have talked about miracle fruit for a long time as sort of a novelty fruit that blocks your sweet, uh, blocks your sour receptors on your, your tongue so that you only can taste sweet. And so then you can eat lemons and lemons taste sweet instead of sour. I kind of found it tasted weird. Um, it's kind of a novelty. If you want to try growing it, go for it. It's uh, very picky. It wants high humidity, pure water, like you can't even use tap water on it. Um, it wants no frost. It, it just seemed like it wasn't worth it. So I gave up on it after a while. And then quickly, Solanaceae, Cape Gooseberry, just thought I'd mention one thing about it. It's widely known, so there's not much to say. The only thing I'd say is that it, it thrives with neglect and it grows well in the ground. Just put it somewhere and leave it alone and you'll get lots of Cape Gooseberries and wait till they fall to the ground before harvesting them and then you'll get the best flavor. That's pretty much all I need to say about it. I think most people have seen these around. Pepino's similar. It seems to not be fussy. You just leave it alone and you'll get lots of sort of egg-sized honeydew melon-like fruits. Um, it's a pretty nice one. I think there are some cultivars that are going around that um, are easy to root, so just get a cutting of it and root it. There are other species that people talk about, like Naranjia and uh, lychee tomato. These are just not worth growing. They are so thorny that you're just gonna stick your fingers over and over again, and the, you get a complex cherry tomato for it. It's really not a worthwhile fruit to grow, except as a novelty. I mean, Naranjia is so bad that it has thorns coming out of its leaves, like giant thorns coming out of its leaves. It's just not, it's not worth growing. And then finally, we're at the end, turmeric and ginger. So these are absolutely worth growing. Uh, this is my turmeric plant. Uh, it's easy to grow from a root, uh, which is a rhizome. Uh, you can just get a, an organic grocery store turmeric or ginger and put it in the ground and it'll grow. Um, it wants no frost and it wants wind protection. It tends to like being in sort of semi-shade. 
um, the root is used as a spice. So just let it grow for a while and then dig up some, make sure you leave a few in the ground so that you have enough for it to regrow. Um, it's a pretty easy plant to grow. Okay, so that was a whirlwind of the species. I'm gonna talk about growing practices and what to grow and stuff like that. I know, it's, like I said, it's a long talk. Um, the, I before, take questions on the species. Real... Yes, go for it. Yeah, um, just before we go on, it sounds like we're going into another segment. There were some questions about, you, you had mentioned um, in your slides that uh, the very best, sir, uh, forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, sir, uh, Narum cherry cultivars sure were, yeah. yeah, were better than cherries. Myself and another person were like, well, what varieties are those? Well, this, I give credit to, <laughs> I give credit to Marta. Marta has found a variety uh, that is, I think, better than cherries. Um, I don't remember what she called it, I, but um, yeah, Marta, if she's still here, can put it in the chat. There are a number of us in Monterey Bay area growing some of Marta's seedlings out and uh, great. passing those around. That's great. Yeah, so Marta's found some really good Suriname cherries, so um, hopefully those get widely distributed. I'm also growing a variety that's widely grown in, in Florida called Black Star. It's a pretty good one. It's much bigger fruited than the one that Marta, uh, uh, Marta's selection was, at least that one selection of hers. Um, it's, a, um, it's sweet, it doesn't have a musky flavor, but I wouldn't say it's better than the cherry. Uh, Marta just pro provide a response. Waruja Red was the name of Marta's. Ah, yes. Is there another, any other questions on the species? I know that's sort of a crazy list. Um, I was going for completeness because it was a, it was hard to know whether it's, there are people who are looking for the common fruits or interested in common fruits or some of the value I think in going through all of those was to say, some of these are just not worth trying, at least in my opinion, because you know, I, I ended up going through a lot of detours and cul-de-sacs and sort of experimenting with all these species, and some of them were just kind of not worth the time. I think there is definitely something for everyone in there, and yeah, <laughs> it, it is really useful to hear what you just couldn't succeed with. And so, uh, which? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, one question here is, do you happen to know which of the passiflora would be true to seed, which would be need to be grown from a cutting? Yeah, so I grew most of them from seed. Um, I think of all the ones that I've grown, the ones that I've grown from cutting have been, Frederick is, you know, the common cultivar I grow from cutting. Um, Mission Dolores, I've grown from cutting. Uh, Passiflora Phoenicia, Ruby Glow, I've grown from cutting. Um, other than those, I think I've grown everything else from seed. And do you have any suggestions on propagation of strawberry guava? Yeah, so I've just grown that from seed. Um, I think you can ground layer it. Um, I think most of the Mertaceae are pretty easy to ground layer. Um, and I find, find ground layering with Mertaceae much easier than uh, air layering or growing from cuttings. But seed is so easy. You just mash the fruit into some soil and, you know, if you want to put it on a heat mat and it'll you'll get a bunch of seedlings. The only problem with a lot of the Mertaceae is the seeds are so small that you really have to baby those seedlings for like a year before they really start growing on their own. Um, they, you know, same thing with pineapple guava seedlings. They're just so tiny for so long. Hey, Barack, this is Irene. Mm -hmm. um, does the Jamaican cherry, does it need to be sitting in water? I heard, I heard that it need to be in standing water and then I heard that it doesn't. What, what, uh, wh which one is it? I don't leave mine in standing water, um, but mostly I don't do and leave anything in standing water because I don't want mosquitoes. But, um, but generally, I've been fine without leaving it in standing water. Um, the one that I grew in El Cerrito outdoors, it was just in the ground, and it wasn't in standing water. And then I have one here uh, in Southern California. It's in a container. Um, I don't leave it in standing water, and it's doing fine. Well, except my, I, I'm in Pacifica, and I, when I leave it outside, it dies, so I have it inside. Oh, I see. Um, I think even inside, I don't think it would need to be in standing water. I mean, maybe it needs to be watered more frequently than in some other plants, but I don't think it needs to be in standing water. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, 
And then, yep. and then I think that does it for the questions, at least the ones that are been posted in the chat. Okay, great. So since that was the big whirlwind tour, you know, the rest is not, there's not, we're most of the way through the talk. So what I want to talk about now really quick is suggestions of things to grow for a few different zones. Um, and like I said, I'll share the slides later. So, you know, if you don't catch anything or don't catch something, it's fine. You know, uh, it'll be available. Um, this is sort of my list. You know, a lot of these are well known, but some of them aren't widely grown. So like Chilean guava could be more widely grown. I think it should be. Um, macadamia could be more widely grown. Um, Catherine's gumi is an excellent fruit. Um, mostly that's a matter of sort of getting sources for propagation. Um, lemon guava also could be quite widely grown and just happens not to be. Um, cherimoya, maybe it's a matter of hand pollination that people don't want to do it or, you know, is not as widely known of a fruit, but it could easily be grown widely um, in sort of marginal zone 9B, 10A sort of locations throughout Santa Cruz County, Santa Clara County, and, you know, other areas in, North, in the East Bay and so on. Um, Guabiju is less known, but I think is an easy one to grow. Cherry of the Rio Grande is an easy one to grow. And then, as I mentioned, Suriname cherry. Um, I think Longin is worth, especially in hot locations like San Jose or, or Concord or places like that, Longin is worth growing because you have enough heat to get enough growth that even if you get dieback in the winter, you'll still be okay. Whereas sort of less hot zone 9B locations don't get enough summer heat that they won't grow enough to sort of offset the dieback in the winter. Um, the same thing is true with guava. You want to do that in a hot location where you get enough growth that the dieback is worth it. Jabata cabas, some of them are actually pretty cold tolerant. So that's the kind of thing that's so slow growing, you might as well. And ice cream bean might be viable depending on how much frost you get. To add to that list, I'd say these are the ones that are sort of the top of the list for zone 10A. Um, Jamaican cherry, I think is a great fruit, even though it's so tiny. Um, Lilikoi is definitely worth growing. It seems to need a little bit more warmth than it doesn't like the dieback um, as much as normal edulis. Um, Lucuma, babaco, bananas should be widely grown and they're pretty easy to grow. Um, Mexican garcinia, as I mentioned. Um, and then just to call out one other, um, I think that uh, people should definitely try growing coffee um, and some of these passifloras. Um, they're they're not as widely grown, but they're not that hard as long as you give them sort of wind protection. Um, and also sugarcane. If you have, you know, if you happen to have sort of water running off from something else in your yard anyway, just plant the sugarcane at the place where you get water runoff and it'll happily soak up all that extra water and then you get good growth on it. Um, and then finally, some extras if you have a zone 10B or 11A. Um, not too many of you probably do, but just to mention it. Um, Definitely grow mango, ginger, turmeric, um, maybe even in zone 10A, but definitely in these 10B, 11A. Um, Jamaican passion fruit, which is laurifolia, um, and then some of the imbe and achacheru, these garcinias, um, and then some of the real sort of tropicals like jackfruit and guaya and papaya, tamarind, so on. Um, Ilama, marula, and chacha fruit are kind of a little bit more esoteric and a little bit trickier to actually get them to, to grow well. So those are just sort of the quick recommendations on, and that's like a very coarse grained view of what to grow. Um, and then some thoughts on how to grow some of these things. So propagation thoughts. So because I've been growing so many random things, I've run into a lot of, it's been a lot of trial and error. Um, for cuttings, a heat mat is really useful. Uh, rooting hormone is helpful, but it's, neither of these is essential. Often what I'll do is I'll just use a black plastic pot on a sunny day, you know, on a time when I know there's sunny weather, just leave it in a sunny spot and make sure I water it every day. Sometimes I'll put a bag, plastic bag with a couple of holes over it just to get some airflow. But, you know, that's all you need for some cuttings. Um, ground layering is easy for Mertaceae. I would highly recommend doing ground layering rather than some other approaches. Um, container only growing is good for pineapple, jabata cava, and ginger and turmeric. Those are the ones that I've had the best success with. Um, not to say that others don't do well, but these three probably you could keep going in, in containers for almost forever. Um, direct seeding, I would highly recommend direct seeding avocado, white zapote, mango, jackfruit, and lychee. These are the ones where transplanting seems to not work too well. Um, and that direct seeding, they really get a good root system. They become more drought tolerant and they just don't die back as much. Um, air layering, lychee, and longan, those are the only two I've actually bothered air layering. Um, not, I think a lot of others can be air layered, but I just haven't. 
Um, and then multi-root stocking, I've mentioned, I've only tried it with avocado and mango. I believe it works across a lot of species. I just haven't tried. And then grafting thoughts. Um, I've been using the, uh, this is a tip from somebody from Florida, um, a chick injector blade, which is kind of like this hobbyist blade, very, very sharp on a hobby handle. Um, and it's very good for a lot of these tropicals where sometimes the, the wood is very soft. Um, you need a really sharp, clean cut on it. Um, it's worked out really well, like especially for star fruit grafting. Um, I found that this blade is like the right thing. Um, large scions, pretty much any sharp knife is what I use. I've stopped using buddy tape because I found that some of the, the scions that aren't really strong enough to push through buddy tape struggle and then they get tangled in the buddy tape. Um, and the buddy tape tends to not disintegrate as fast as normal parafilm. So I've switched back to using parafilm. Um, I wrap the graft union with a layer of parafilm and then I wrap it with one of these budding rubbers or the grafting rubbers, the sort of BF Goodrich rubber stuff, which disintegrates after a while. So that way you don't end up girdling the, the graft union. Um, and then I check for growing buds beneath the graft daily for about a month or more. Um, and I've made the mistake sometimes of changing the lighting conditions after I do a graft and sometimes I end up burning the newly emerged buds. And so what I usually tr try and do now, but I still sometimes forget, is when a graft is growing, it's emerging, the buds are pushing, to leave it alone where exactly where I grafted it, especially when it's in a container. Um, experimental rootstocks. So I've tried plant doing hardy passiflores as the rootstock for tropical passiflores. So uh, passiflora cerulea is a really vigorous uh, passiflora. When you graft on it, you get a lot of vigorous growth. The problem is that it suckers too much and it becomes a big hassle. So I stopped trying that one. Um, Chuck Chan suggested Betty Miles Young. That may be a good option in the Bay Area. I've been growing that one. And then I think for Southern California, Frederick is actually a good rootstock for, because it's very vigorous, as a rootstock for some of the tropical passiflora's like Laurifolia, um, because it'll give you that vigor that you may not get during the winter. Um, I've done papaya on mountain papaya, like I mentioned earlier, koyo on avocado and av avocado on koyo, um, and then maprang on mango. Um, so all of these are to try to impart some more hardiness than the species has. Um, lychee on longan, um, that one I don't know how it's going to turn out. Rolinia on Cherimoya seems to be okay, but I don't know if it's going to fruit well. Jackfruit on Kwai Mook has not worked out so far for me, but we'll see. Um, Mexican Garcinia on Achache Ru or Imbe. I've done it on Achache Ru. It grows fine, but it doesn't seem to grow much faster. On Imbe, um, somebody in San Diego has had good success on that. And then Loquat on Quince, you get good dwarfing. Um, improving yield and health, coffee grounds, coffee grounds, coffee grounds. So the bananas, like I mentioned earlier, on that eight square feet of soil, um, what I managed to do was across the street was a coffee shop. I went there and I said, I'm gonna give you all a trash can, just please dump your coffee grounds in that. And then once a week I'd go over there, I'd drag the trash can across the street with like 20 ga gallons of, of coffee grounds in it. And I just dump it straight on the soil. Um, and this was a 7-Eleven laundromat parking lot. And I had basically taken over their, their land and started planting stuff in it. And they didn't really care because they didn't, you know, it was just weeds before that. So I just kept dumping coffee grounds on this soil. And I was probably giving about 10 gallons per month per tree during the summer. Um, and that yielded fruiting two bananas on eight square feet of compact urban soil. Um, for banana peels, um, sometimes what I did is I just threw the banana peels in the pile of coffee grounds. Um, I've also considered, but I never really got around to chopping it up because, you know, it's probably better for it to decompose that way. Um, sometimes the coffee shop would also have like a brunch and so they would throw their eggshells in. That was nice. I think that helped the bananas because they need a little bit of calcium. Um, one problem with doing the pure coffee grounds approach, you end up getting a mat of coffee grounds and then it becomes hydrophobic and then the water runs off of it and that's no good. So. Often what I did was I would mix the coffee grounds with some soil or some mulch or whatever I had, just so that I keep the coffee from forming a mat. Um, I think one of the other benefits is that the coffee grounds definitely does decrease the pH. I don't know how much. There are articles you'll find online that say composted coffee grounds do not decrease pH, but I'm pretty sure that 
coffee grounds that are just straight from the coffee shop are going to decrease your pH a little bit. And we tend to have higher pH soils than these subtropicals and tropicals want. So coffee grounds just have been successful across the board for me. The only ones that don't seem to like it are the sort of deserty plants. So acerola, so Barbados cherry, that doesn't seem to want lower pH and doesn't like coffee grounds. Guamuchil doesn't want it. Um, I don't know about tamarind, but like some of these sort of high heat desert kind of trees, you probably don't want to give them coffee grounds, but otherwise it's like a universal fertilizer that I use. Um, planning. So I pretty much at the end here, I sort of ran out of time with this. So I'm only going to talk a little bit about this, but basically the considerations when planning out where to put things, I'm sort of looking at sun and shade requirements, frost and chill requirements, subtropicals and tropicals don't need chill usually. So um, whether you can use a tropical to shade a temperate tree that then you can induce more chill in the temperate tree. Um, uh, heat needs, they vary very widely from something like Antioquiensis, which wants San Francisco shade, to Ilama, which wants the hottest inland Orange County or LA heat. Um, and then water needs, uh, they will vary widely from something like Guamuchil, which thrives on 10 inches a year in, in you know, leeward Hawaii, to Starfruit and Jabatacapa, which wants daily water, um, otherwise they start getting sad. Um, and then pH needs. Some of these really want low pH. The desert plants want alkaline and neutral. Um, and then this is a little bit more speculative, but some of the research, I'm a computer science uh, researcher, you know, I'm not a, uh, a horticulturalist, but I've been trying to merge this a little bit and thinking about how we can do this planning process, sort of, you can think of it as a game almost to simplify the sort of way to think about it. Um, and then you sort of have all these locations that you're planting at. And, you know, you break down your, your farm or your garden as a grid, you could think, okay, well, you know, this is like a chessboard or something, and I'm putting trees in, and you're not just doing it one time, you're sort of doing it over time. So it's, there's a time dimension. So you have the two dimensions of the grid, and then you have a time dimension where you're placing a tree or doing something to the tree at each point in time. And then you can add a fourth dimension, which is your vertical dimension, your canopy layer. So you can have something in the shade, something in the, uh, you know, the canopy. And then the next step, which is something that we're sort of kicking around and working on is write software to play this game. Effectively, software that can play the game of planning out such a garden or farm um, effectively. Because I on, often find I'll, I'll be helping somebody plan out a piece of land and I'll be thinking about these 150 species or more and thinking, where do I plant things and what should I plant and what are the constraints? And this one needs to be next to that one and it wants shade and that wants water. How do we? satisfy all of the plants so that they're happy. And so, you know, all of those dimensions all together is something that I'd like to write, something that can help me and help others plan that kind of thing out. And then old photos don't really matter. So I'm pretty much done at this point. So why don't I stop there and I will share the slides in the chat so that everybody can see um, and, and then we'll see after that. So but I'm happy to take questions. And thank you all for listening. It's, I know it was a very long talk. Well, particularly, particularly thank you, Barath. This was really phenomenal. I'm sure there was, I'm gonna, sorry, can you guys hear me? I think I may have muted my. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. You're muted now. <laughs> Andy. You're muted. Oh, oh, there we go. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Technical problems. I'm unmuting you all. Turn your mics on. Let's all give Baroth a big round of applause. I think we all learned a lot from this. I was taking notes left and right. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank you. Thank you. Turn your mics on. But... All right. Well, we've got. 60 or 70 people clapping in here. Um, and okay, so I just shared, by the way, um, links to slides and uh, also to a spreadsheet that I made. Um, one of the things I did not mention is to, to help me in the process of doing these slides, I ranked all of, the, all of these, my personal ranking of flavor from one to 10 and practicality in California from one to 10. 
And you'll see that in the spreadsheet. Right now it's sorted by flavor. Um, you could copy this and resort it by something else if you wanted to. But go ahead, any questions, anyone? Yeah, um, let's start with John Valenswell. Are you here? He, he was asking if you have any thoughts on Dovialis or K-Apple. K-Apple, yes. So I've had some K-Apples. Um, I found the flavor really weird. It, it has kind of a weird bitterness underneath it. Um, I gave it to one of my relatives. I harvested a bunch of K-Apples in San Diego one time, gave it to a relative of mine who really likes sour fruits, and he was over the moon for these. But I just could not get into them, and I never bothered. And if I remember right, they're also extremely thorny, so I just never have bothered growing K-Apple. Cool. Um, Don are you pulling some questions or? Yeah. Uh, Feel free to reiterate. Look, so everybody's off. unmuted. If anybody has questions, uh, feel free to ask. Um, Reed has a question about uh, fruiting passiflora. Reed, do you, you want to? Oh, now can you hear me? First, thank you, brah. That was incredible and overwhelming in a good way. Um, <laughs> a friend of mine gave me Passiflora lig ligularis mm -hmm. and has had a lot of trouble fruiting it, or he hasn't had flowers for years. Have you had any luck or anyone who's fruiting that? Yeah, so I flowered it, and like I mentioned, somebody in the Golden Gate chapter in San Francisco said that he's fruiting. Sorry, if we can pray quickly, I'm going to have to mute, so, because we're getting, sorry, we're getting feedback, a lot of feedback. Um, so, yeah, so Ligulara, somebody in uh, San Francisco apparently has fruited it. So, somebody I gave a plant to in San Diego fruited it. Um, there's two things about it. It really hates wind. I mean, to an extent that almost none of the other Passifloras. It has very thin leaves, very big heart-shaped leaves, and they just get battered in the wind. So you have to give it a lot of wind protection. Um, it also hates the sun, but it wants some amount of sun. So it's this very delicate balance. It seems to like to grow inside of tree canopy. So it sort of gets like dappled sun. Um, it also needs cross-pollinators. So you, you know, it's the tricky, it also wants, I think, a couple of years of growth before it will even start flowering. So you kind of got to get it to a size without it getting damaged by frost or wind, probably two to three years in, then probably, you know, if you really need to push it with like a bloom boosting sort of fertilizer to try and force it to bloom, then cross pollinate it and then you might get something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's a little bit of a hassle, I think. No, that's, that's great. Do you know like a couple of pollinators off the top of your head that are typical? That or? should be successful. So apparently people have had luck with almost all the standard ones. Oh, so edulis great. will work. Uh, another Ligularis will work. A lot of, or fully all of the related ones will work. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. The only thing that seems to not work, the taxonias seem to not work for all the other Passifloras and vice versa. Like you can't use Antioquiensis for edulis and vice versa. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Reed. How long would, would you expect ice cream bean to fruit from seed? Um, so the one on the Greenway, I think, in, Al in Albany, has fruited in four-ish years from seed. I think that's probably, I mean, and it's not a very high heat location. So I think it's possible even in less than that in a high heat location. And I've, I've heard of them growing, you know, five, ten feet a year in Hawaii. So I think it's the kind of thing that will grow at crazy speed if you give it the right environment. Uh, the other questions just really are kind of general about this, this uh, plant versus that plant. I don't know if we want to get into those specifically. Uh, yeah, sure. uh, okay, so one, one person is asking about Indian coffee plum, uh, but the question is just what about it? Uh, <laughs> I, actually, I actually don't know that one. What is the species? Okay. Irene, um, do you want to do you want to uh, speak up and talk more about your question? Hey, yeah. Uh, hang on. Let, let, uh, let, uh, let me go, go go find the tag and then I'll put down the scientific name. Okay. Okay. And then, Sounds good. And then I'll come okay. back. 
let, let me okay. that. In the meantime, maybe you can talk and I can put Molly Ong on. She wants to know more about white sapote, which I think is of general interest to a lot of people. Agreed. Molly, you can chime in if you're around to talk. Hi, I, I want to talk about, I want to ask about uh, white sapote. What varieties are good? I missed that. Uh, oh, what varieties are good? So, um, well, so first thing I should say, Tom Addison has done an excellent talk that should be on YouTube about every detail of white sapote. He knows way more than anybody I know about it. So that's, you know, a resource everyone should check out. Um, the ones that I've had best luck with are, Vernon is sort of universally the easiest one that I've grown because it's precocious, it's vigorous, and it produces good fruit. So about two years, you'll get fruit from, from Vernon. Um, Walton is also a really good fruit. Um, the thing that's interesting about Walton is that it is the opposite of Vernon. It puts on a ton of growth. It's very vigorous. It does not fruit easily. Um, it seems to, you know, I planted uh, a multi-grafted one for my parents in Aptos, Vernon and a, a Walton multi-graft. The Vernon is already setting fruit. Um, I think it's three years in, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's not in the optimal position that branch isn't. Whereas the Walton, um, I want to say it's about 15 feet, 20 feet up in the air, and it's not fruiting, it's not flowering. So you get very different sort of behavior. Um, the, one of the ones I really like is uh, Robert Scott uh, selected a seedling of rainbow that I named Robert's rainbow because I didn't have another name for it. Mm -hmm. It's a very good fruit, very lemony flavor, kind of like some of the really good ones have this very lemony flavor to them. Um, so Robert's rainbow is one of those. Um, and then there are several others that are sort of well known to have good flavor, you know, Malibu number three and Rainbow and um, a bunch of others. I often end up grafting Vernon for people just because it's, it's so fast to fruit that it's, you know, you don't have to wait forever. Thank you. Um, Unfortunately, I don't know Indian coffee plum. I see the name there, the species Irene. I'm sorry, I actually have not tried growing that. So one well, more to add to the species list for me. Well, actually, I uh, I ordered that uh, uh, seed and is and is doing really nicely inside inside my house mm -hmm. as a potted plant, mm -hmm. and so it's doing much better than the Jamaican cherry. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm wondering. I see. Well, I'd be happy to try growing it at some point. I have not. Um, um, we have a question from Mark H about. Uh, mulberry grafting, if you want to speak up, Mark. We also have a question about Amla and Indian gooseberry. Mm -hmm. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much. A fantastic presentation. Um, <clears throat> have you tried any white Pakistani mulberry? Um, so I've tried the, I guess it's the white mulberry. Um, so it's like uh, with some, there's one called Illinois Everbearing um, that's sort of out there. Um, if I remember right, the, the reason they call it white was because of the flower, right? And, um, something like that, not the fruit color. But um, I've tried what looks like white fruit dried from Turkey. So like Turkish white dried mulberry, and I did not like it very much. But I don't know if that was just a bad cultivar or not very well dried or something like that. Um, so among the various mulberries I've tried, uh, uh, Illinois Everbearing, Pakistan, um, various types of Morris Nigro, so there's like a S Spain something and like a normal one, Black Butte, there's a few of them. They all seem to taste the same to me, um, of the, the black mul mulberries. And then um, I've mostly just settled on Pakistan and, and Persian. Excellent. And um, during COVID, do you have any suggestions on where to get seeds and <laughs> seedlings and that type of stuff? So the, the best source for a lot of these tropicals is Oscar uh, in Hawaii, so fruitlovers.com. Um, he grows so many different species. Um, he's been a source for a lot of the seeds that I've gotten over the years. And, um, so, and his seeds are really like really well packed so they don't, uh, they don't rot or anything like that. Um, the thing is that he's only gonna send them when they're in season. So you may wait a year or something like that for them to be in season. Um, that's probably the best. One, one thing of word of warning, um, there are some pas passiflora seeds online are terrible. Um, 
I have not found a reliable source of Passiflora seed, except for like Oscar, but he only has a very limited selection. A lot of the Passiflora seed sellers, you get the wrong species pretty often, um, or you get non-viable seed. Um, so I just, I don't recommend most of the Passiflora's out there. Um, Tradewind Seeds has a lot of interesting stuff. Their stuff is pretty decent. Um, some of it is a little old or a little dried out or something, but you know, you, they, they carry a number of interesting varieties. So it's worth checking out some of them. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, question about Fed Frederick passion fruit. Have you ever seen any conditions where it fails to grow? We have someone who's looking for tank boost growth on a edulis, I guess. Yeah, so I have seen it fail to grow in a couple of ways. One is that up. So first of all, in a container, sometimes you don't get good growth. It really likes to be in the ground. It's so vigorous. Um, but in the ground, sometimes it needs more heat than a normal edulis does to really produce good fruit. So if you're in a coastal location, Frederick is not a great option. A plain purple, uh, you know, the of the named cultivars, Black Knight is probably your best one, but you could just get any old uh, seedling of a plain purple passion fruit. Um, those are the smaller sort of small egg sized rather than the large egg sized purple passion fruits. And you'll actually get some decent sweetness out of them. Cool. Hope that helps you a bit, Lini. Um, yeah. Any other questions coming in? I'm looking back in the, the history. I see a bunch of questions that I don't think I've. Yeah. If you want to scroll back to any of those, it's a little, a little hard to keep up with them. Yeah. So, um, Yeah, so it was about source material. Somebody asked, um, so yeah, generally it's been from all these different seed sources and trading and so on. So I guess we talked about that a little bit. The mm -hmm. Zespri band of, brand of kiwis is, uh, they do carry gold. That's the golden Activinia chinensis. Um, and uh, let's see here, soil mix for pineapple. Soil mix for pineapple, I've been mostly just using um, a little bit of perlite mixed in with whatever random soil and they don't seem to be picky. Right now I have some of my uh, pineapples growing in basically uncomposted pine tree mulch. So like pine tree that has gone through a tree trimmers, you know, mulching machine, almost uncomposted. And I have pineapples growing in that and they don't seem to mind because they just have very little root system. So they don't seem to care. Um, hmm. So it's been fine. And what I've been doing for them is I actually, when I, whatever my previous day's coffee grounds, I just have a French press. I just take the coffee and I just pour it straight on top of the pineapple plant. Um, is, is, that, is that your only food source then, the coffee in that, envir that environment then? Yes, for the pineapple, yeah. it's just the coffee. Yeah, yeah. Wow. and it seems to like that. Um, and uh, prickly pear makes great sherbet. That's good. Oh, I guess somebody had gotten a chacha fruto for me and it died. So chacha fruto just seems like a tough one. Um, and moringa, somebody asked about moringa. Yes. So I've grown moringa. It grows fast during the summer. It likes heat. Um, I did long ago try growing some amla. Um, I don't remember which type it was. My parents had asked me about amla also, um, Indian gooseberry. Uh, I don't know much about it, and I've heard that there's two very distinct varieties or even maybe species of it, and I don't know which one I have grown. So if somebody's growing it, it might be worth sort of spreading that around. Um, about the coffee grounds of banana peels. Um, I've got a question. Go for it. You mentioned at a prior meeting some techniques you had for multi-grafting, multi-grafting being a great way to collect varieties um, in a small area, mm -hmm. uh, techniques for species that might have problems with dominance, like avocado. Um, how have you found success with that? Yeah, so I've mostly, um, so it depends on the species. Um, for, for most of the ones that are relatively slow growing in California, I haven't had too many problems with one, one graft overgrowing the other too much. And what I've tended to do, I mean, this is really cheating, but in the container context, I've just rotated the plant so that the lower or slower growing graft 
was facing south. So it was just never going to get shaded by the, the other graph. Um, sometimes I've even done, I've even cheated in other ways to, to make sure that the, the multi-graft can actually take off, which is I'll tilt the tree itself. So if it's in a container, mm -hmm. I actually, I have some mango trees that I've literally, I took a five gallon, I potted it up into a 15 and I planted it at an angle, which is a little crazy, mm -hmm. but that way I could sort of force growth on one of the grafts that wasn't growing as fast and now it's growing faster. So, you know, think weird things like that sometimes. For avocados, the, there was the 7-Eleven avocado tree that I was mentioning in Berkeley. Um, that one at, at its peak when the gardeners hadn't sort of hacked it apart, um, I think had six or seven cultivars on it and they didn't seem to be affecting each other. Like I had Nishikawa growing on one branch and I had a Koyo growing on the other side. The main tree was a surprise. Um, it had a John Hurd scion hanging off the back. Um, it had, I think, Fujikawa coming on. Anyway, there was a bunch of different cultivars on it. Um, and they all seemed to be doing fine and they didn't seem to be sort of constricting each other in any way. Excellent. Awesome. You have it saved already. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I have a question about the perfect. urban planning that you've done. Uh, have that has that been done like with permission? Is it more of like this is planted this and see what happens type of thing, or I was kind of curious about that. Yeah. So I did a little bit of both. So the way I started was I was just planting on the street side in Berkeley when I was living there without asking, um, and just you know there was so much urban soil that was street sidewalk strip soil that was just dead. Um, and it was hard, compacted, you know, standard urban sidewalk strip soil. And so I just started, you know, either digging in it or whatever and just planting stuff. Um, and a lot of the different things that, you know, probably I tended towards things that were hardier with didn't require as much care because I just wasn't going to be able to take care of them a lot. Some of the locations had no source of water. So I intentionally planned it such that you know, like for example, there was one location where there was a sidewalk that was slightly tilted. And so what I did was I dug an inch trench right on the, the sort of downhill side of the sidewalk. And then I filled that with gravel so that it basically would like capture that water instead of it just running right off into the, into the gutter. Mm. Um, and so that way that sidewalk strip was getting like, you know, double the effective rainfall that it was going to normally get. And so then I planted stuff there and they did great. So like, you know, some of them were temperate, like I planted a persimmon there, but also a strawberry guava. And then like one location around the corner from that, I planted direct seeded white sapotes. So I took a bunch of the, my favorite fruits that I had gotten from Tom and I just put the seeds straight in there. I gave them a deep watering one time. And last I checked on them, those seedlings are like 20 feet tall. Um, and so, you know. Did you have any lawnmowers going after you? No, I haven't had that problem because they, okay. they were all like sidewalk strip. Um, the, the other urban stuff, so there was like a parking lot garden area that was all dead that was next to that. That was the 7-Eleven, the Berkeley uh, bananas that I grew. Um, so those, there's a little bit of contentious back and forth. Like the bananas that I planted there, I never got to replant or allow them to regrow because there was like a sort of flower stand that was in front of that had been derelict mm. for a long time. And then somebody decided they were gonna start a business in it. So they said, I gotta chop it down. Um, and so I chopped down the banana tree after it. It had already fruited anyway, but, um, and then How there was the water green the bananas. Bananas. That was bucket watering. I carried, <laughs> I carried buckets to the bananas. Yeah. That's dedication. For two years. It was, and so that's also how the Loney Greenway worked for, for two or three years. And Molly and Ken are doing, and, and Frank are doing the heroic work of keeping it going. So Ohlone Greenway in Albany was different. That one was too big for me to do a, sort of a guerrilla gardening. It's a one mile stretch of land, technically. And so um, I first tried approaching Berkeley. Berkeley's uh, process was too complicated. It was a bigger city and they had had some bad luck in the past with it. So they just said, we're not gonna do any more of these plantings because there's lead in the soil a lot of places and they didn't wanna remediate and that costs money. So in Albany, the, you know, I basically approached the, the Parks Commission and I said, here's my proposal. You know, I'm going to do all the planting myself. I'm going to do a propagation myself, the watering. It didn't cost the city nothing. Um, the, 
the only thing that I want is just, I want access to water. And they said, well, yeah, water hookups here, you can hook up to water. So, um, and so then it took a two year process from starting that to getting, to put a proposal forward, to get to the city, the parks commission, then the city council, and then it got approved. And then I could start planting. So it was about two years start to finish to get the process going. And then, you know, then things are started rolling. Then I could start planting. And then for the first year or so, I just did the planting by myself. Um, so it was bucket watering, direct seeding and stuff like that. Um, and then Frank joined and then Molly and Ken joined and others have joined. And so, and unfortunately I moved away, so they've kept it going. That's a really awesome and, and inspiring project. And in fact, um, so I want to get back to it to help keep it going <laughs> because it's, you know, it's a tough project to keep going and get things established. Well, if you don't mind me interjecting, some of us are actually doing, having some success doing municipal plantings in, here in Santa Cruz. In fact, That's I great. see Lizzie, Lizzie in the chat. Um, we have, we've done some work with the city of Santa Cruz parks and via the look up the Santa Cruz community orchard and you can plug in with us. We've been introducing hundreds of people to, fruit culture so that's, that's been really positive just putting putting it right out there on the sidewalk um and your project is really inspiring in that way too thanks all right so somebody mentioned mamoncio so um mamoncio is an interesting fruit that's the one i've tried that's related to guaya and lychee and so on um I like the flavor as well. It doesn't have much pulp. It's mostly like seed and pulp kind of hanging onto the seed. Um, guaya is supposed to be a sweeter, sort of slightly more pulp fruit that's related to mamoncillo. And so that's partly why I'm growing it and not growing mamoncillo. So mamoncillo is also known as Spanish lime um, and I have some other names that I don't remember. Um, what else? John, you want to speak up? John Valenzuela? Uh, I see John's uh, maybe not. Tree, tree yeah. tomato, dwarf tamarillo. Right, and, right there now. <laughs> go for it. Yeah, we can hear you now. Hey, uh, hey thanks so much, uh, Brath, for your public fruit tree planting legacy you've left here up here in the Bay Area. It's, it's really inspiring. Uh, just had a question. Did you have any comments on some of the other Solanaceae, like um, the tree tomatoes or tamarillos or the dwarf tamarillo? Also, something really easy I found is those are those uh, rocoto peppers, you know, this perennial pubescence. Yeah. Great one. Yeah, those are so um, a tree tomato is great. Um, I grew it a lot in El Cerrito in Berkeley. Um, it seems to, yeah. A very easy tree to grow uh, or plant to grow. Um, the thing, only thing I guess I noticed is that it doesn't like wind because the leaves are so giant. Um, but I found an El Cerrito, for example, I didn't have to water it after I planted it. It just, you know, was fine on just whatever water it was able to get um, and produced pretty well. I like it. The one thing that um, I guess I wish is that there was a way to sort of get higher yield off of it. I mean, relative to the size of the tree, it's not as high yielding as a tomato would be, like an annual tomato. Um, yeah. Whereas you can get a cherry tomato in Southern California anyway to, to be a perennial and keep growing your, you know, over the winter and then through the spring and you keep getting yield off of it. So if there was a way to sort of push the yield on tree tomatoes, it would be really nice. Um, the tamarillo, I did grow it at one point. Um, I don't remember too much about how it did, so I can't really comment on it much. Ricotto peppers, I grew a ton of varieties of ricottos, thinking that I might be able to find one that doesn't completely set my mouth on fire. Yes. <laughs> and I never found one that reliably did. I found one where at least the, the flesh of it was not sort of, you know, mouth burning. But if you got even a tiny bit of seed, it was over. And so... <laughs> You know, that was the, always the problem with them. They were just too hot for me. I mean, I really like spicy food, but these were just off the charts. And so I, I hope somebody's trying to breed a slightly less uh, hot cultivar. I think that's the holy grail. I've made inquiries to people who specialize in these. And yeah. I think it's great. You can just have a hot pepper in cool weather. So, it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Although, you know what? I found that uh, um, just, just normal jalapenos and serrano peppers will grow as a perennial in frost-free location. Like in Berkeley, my serrano grew for four years, I think. It was producing serranos year-round. With, with some of those, it's hard here, like in Capitola or Aptos area, it's hard to do it just because it's just the, la lock, or the lack of heat. And so that particular pepper does well in a cool environment. So... Yeah, yeah. Um, All right. Well, excellent. Well, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I think from here, maybe we'll just open it up to everyone for a final goodbye. But um, again, thank you so much, Broth. Is there anything you want to leave us with, like a plug or a contact if people want to follow up on anything or maybe you'll provide some of your materials I mean, for us to post on our website or something. I mean, if anybody wants to email me, I'll put my email here in the chat. Um, and, you know, other than that, yeah, thank, thanks for having me. I'm happy to chat with anybody, you know, now, uh, anyone has further questions or over email. Well, unmute yourselves. Let's all make a big noise at Baroth again. Um, this was phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you very much. And everyone yeah, thank you. yell at each other for the next <laughs> minutes until we cut this thing off. Um, yeah, I, I can hang out for another 15 minutes or so if anyone has further questions. Awesome. Thank you, Baroth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, it's so nice to see so many beautiful people on here. It's nice just to see people. <laughs> just to see people right now, right? <laughs> it's great to see people. People are talking to me and everything like that. It's so fantastic. Thank you, Joe. Good night, folks. So, Andy, have you been planting a lot of the sort of subtropicals? Is that, Santa Cruz is kind of an interesting area to plant in because it's kind of it, it's a borderline climate in a lot of ways. Some areas yeah. of Santa Cruz are frost free. Some areas have a little bit too much frost for the subtropical. We have a lot of mild microclimates, I think. Um, I think a prevalent issue where a lot of the population is a lot of the lack of heat to develop and ripen a lot yeah. of things. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been growing a lot of containerized stuff as well, and I'm just starting to get more in the ground to see how it does with hardiness, to see how it does with production. But yeah, I've fruited coffee really successfully. Um, I've tasted some... Deli several delicious varieties of bananas fruited in Santa Cruz town, um, many white sapotes. I have a cherimoya that fruited five years from seed and, uh, you know, pineapple in my greenhouse. But um, yeah, excited to see what comes of a lot of these eugenias and guavas mm -hmm. and stuff. Actually speaking of one, so Sunil has asked about jamun. So jamun is one where I grew it from seed one time so this is a Sigigium, Sigigium. I don't know exactly what the right pronunciation is. I always say Sigigium. Um, so Jamun, um, I have some relatives who grew it in Texas, in Houston, and it seemed to grow fine for them in, in that kind of weather. And that's what it seems to really thrive in. San Ramon probably is similar in that you get a lot of heat, not quite the humidity of Houston. Um, and I don't know about getting it to fruit. Um, maybe you've gotten fruits in the old. Um, I, the, generally I don't grow too much in the Sizigiums just because the fruit is a little bit bland from, at least to my taste. Um, but, you know, it might be interesting. Hey Barack, this is Irene. Um, could you talk about, uh, would you recommend any variety of jujube for the coastal area here for me in Pacifica? I mean, I do get it's super windy and salty air and very foggy here. Unfortunately, I don't know. I, I have never personally grown jujube. Um, I mostly, I don't know, I just never bothered to, I guess. Um, 
So I've eaten it, but I have never grown it. I'm fortunately sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's these weird holes in like my growing experience. Like jujube, I've just never grown. There's a bunch of citrus I've just never tried to grow except the common ones. Um, I don't know. But then I've grown weird citrus like wampy and pink wampy, but I've never grown, you know, like a grapefruit. So wampy. I don't know. Wampy didn't make the slideshow, huh? You know, I, I I excluded all citrus maybe as unfairly. I could have put wampy in there. Well, I, I, I got wampy seedling growing right now inside a house. I figured they, they're not going to make it outside. Yeah, I think they're really tropical. So. You could start building up the next presentation. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like somebody was asking about uh, pineapple guava or strawberry guava in a container. Strawberry guava, you can definitely grow in a container. I've grown it in a, it likes to be in a large container. You don't want it in a small one. Um, and it'll fruit well in a, a large container. Um, pineapple guava, it's weird. It's the kind of thing, like I'd mentioned about fig and you know a lot of the guava family, where it will grow fine in a container and then all of a sudden it'll hit a wall. Like maybe it's literally the roots are hitting the edge of the container and then it just dies back extremely hard. You'll get leaves will just completely defoliate, the branches will die. Um, and it, you have to put in way more effort once it gets to that point to keep it alive. So I've just avoided, if, if I can, of keeping a pineapple guava in a container for too long. Yeah, I've had more, more luck. Sorry, I'm going to mute myself. Um, Tamarind from seed, yeah. So it looks like uh, five feet facing south. Uh, one foot from the wall, how tall can it grow in the Bay Area? I've seen a hundred feet tall in Mumbai, India. That's amazing. Um, so I don't know how tall it can grow. The tamarinds that I've grown have not grown that fast outdoors um, in Southern California even. Uh, like the tamarinds I have here in my yard are growing, you know, in an inch a month, that kind of speed. Maybe they're growing a little faster once in a while, but nothing like the growth I get on other trees. Um, I'm hopeful that somebody can, I know that people have fruited it in, in Southern California, but it still doesn't seem to be fruited that often down here. So it's gonna be really like, if you create the perfect microclimate for it in Northern California, you might be able to fruit tamarind. The one thing I was gonna say, Andy, and for people generally, that um, I feel like passion fruit is something that could be um, widely grown uh, on fence lines, and people could just take advantage of all of the fence lines that exist to grow passion fruit, because it takes almost no extra space to grow a passion fruit when you already have a fence line. Yeah, I was actually gonna ask if you have any strategies not for improving the vigor of passion vines, but suppressing the vicar passion vines or just controlling them or any growing strategies oh. to be able to make them more compatible with other things? Um, I've never tried to grow them with other things so to make them compatible but mostly because I don't care about any of the other things. If I have passion fruit I want it to take over. Just um, pick a big fence line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's the question about should it face any direction. It seems that passion fruit typically will fruit on its sunniest side and not fruit very much on its sort of like north facing side or whatever. Um, so that seems to be a, an issue. Um, so, um, but one of the other things, this is just kind of a random thought. You may have run into this, Andy. Um, I think there needs to be more cats. The problem with growing fruits is too many rodents. At least that's what I always, that seems to be the base big, problem. It's yeah. too many rodents. You end up not getting the fruits. You get grow these awesome fruits and then you can't eat them. Well, the, so, rest, the, problem the rest of the faunal problem. biodiversity might disagree with you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But. I have a problem with cats in my neighborhood. The problem with cats here is any um, bare dirt will get dug up. I see. Okay, so it's a different so if you see, Yeah, so if you seed something, it's going to get dug up. And so to combat that, I have forks all over the place. Plastic forks. 
<laughs> you know, so what about coffee grounds? All, all manner yeah. of native snake and lizard and other beneficial garden creatures. But I concur that rats and increasingly tree squirrels are a huge problem for growing fruit in the city. And because I, all the, yeah. the, the fruits I've planted for relatives, they, you know, two, three years and like the, all of the fruits are gone. And now in Irvine and then like San Francisco, have, there's huge flocks of parrots down here. So uh, the parrots get a lot of the fruits too. That's the other problem I have is then with birds. And raccoons, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, so John was asking about lychee difficult to graft. Yeah, so lychee does seem to be difficult to graft. I have not had great success grafting it, but I've had a little bit. Um, and it seems like the best approach with lychee and long in is just air layering. Um, the reason to graft is that some of the lychees are bad on their own rootstock, like Emperor is known to be bad on its own rootstock. Um, and no my Z, if that's how it's pronounced, is supposed to be bad on its own rootstock. So you kind of want to graft it for vigor. Um, but, you know, that's part of the reason I grafted it onto long end because I figure if I'm going to have to go through the hassle of grafting it, I might as well plant, do it on long end, which is going to maybe impart faster growth. And, it, and the jury is out, I don't know. You've had success grafting it onto long end? Yes, one, cool. one time. But I don't know if it's actually going to make it long term. Um, it seems like, you know, it's not growing great. It's not yeah. growing, but, but part of the thing is I don't know how that cultivar grows. I seem to, like, with both longan and lychee, there seems to be really big difference in terms of vigor between cultivars. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was taught in Hawaii that it was just not worth it. There was delayed incompatibility even on the same species, mm -hmm. lychee and lychee, and, and so they were just always air-layered. But yes. one trick that I thought was really cool that the local um, old timers taught us was that uh, for the tree really to be successful, you had to get a little bit of the soil from underneath the big old mother tree hmm. to inoculate the roots with some, well, now I know it's some kind of rhizobia fungus, you know, that, mm -hmm. from the, that the mother has to inoculate that air layer because that, that little plant never had the connection with the earth like the mother did. And that was their recommendation to really make a successful lychee tree is get a little piece of dirt mm. from the mother. So. <laughs> That's neat. I'd love to see more longons in the Bay Area. Or, you know, that'd be great. Tom told me that he found a uh, seedling longin that was fruiting uh, near the MacArthur BART station in somebody's Ooh. front yard. Wow. And he talked to the guy and he said that he planted it 20 years ago or something from seed. Fantastic. Um, and so, you know, it's like a proof that you know, long and should do fine. You know, if it's doing fine in Oakland, the one at DVC was doing well, at least when I checked on it last. Sweet. Thanks. Um, there's a Pargiat flower tree. I actually don't know what that is. I should look that up. Sunil, feel free to unmute. Um, I don't know this one. Some type of jasmine, I guess. I don't know the one. Hmm. Yeah. Well, close yeah, yeah. it is called night blooming jasmine as well. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I haven't grown that. I don't know too much about it, but I should check it out. Um, and then Mark asked about sapodilla. So, um, if you like the fruit, I think it's worth growing in Northern California. Um, I'm kind of so-so on the fruit. I mean, it's it's a sweet fruit, kind of has a caramelly flavor, but it also has a little bit of the, the flavor of a lot of the other uh, relatives in the Sapotaceae, which I, I kind of call like a sweet potato kind of flavor. I mean, it doesn't have that much of it. Other species in that family have a lot more of the sweet potato-y flavor. Um, you know, like mame and stuff like that, they really have that kind of flavor. Um, I just, I guess I don't like it as much as I should, or people say, maybe I haven't had a good one. But if you really like, if you like the fruit, then it's not that hard to grow. Um, just get an Alano or a Silas Wood. Um, they grow really well from seed. You can just start the seed, 
and they're pretty easy to graft. Um, you can also buy trees of both Alano and Silas Wood. Silas Wood is supposed to be a dwarf cultivar. Um, I couldn't, I mean, it was hard to tell the difference in Northern California in containers. Um, and it fruits, both of them seem to fruit fine in containers. Um, the only thing is that you definitely need to make sure it doesn't get frost. It seems to not be frost tolerant. Star anise. I have not tried growing star anise. Um, I've considered star anise. Um, yeah, so John says maple syrup pear flavor for sapodilla. I've definitely tasted that too, but then there's something about it that like, maybe I've had mame sapotes too many times and not liked them. And I know some people love them, but I just never really got into mame. So that's why it's not in my list. Um, I never bothered trying to grow it. And so I guess I picked up some hint of it in, in Chico Sapote or Sapodilla, so I just didn't. Well, you said leucoma is something that should be widely grown. Is that because you've seen it fruiting around here somewhere? I've seen it fruiting in cold locations in Southern California. Uh -huh. And so that gave me reason to, like, for example, cold locations in like Simi Valley, where they get pretty hard frosts. Um, if it grows there, it'll grow in San Jose, you know, and um, it's, it's a really, it's a productive tree. I think the reason I like leucoma over some of these others is because it seems to be really hardy. It, it does not need very much water. And I guess I'm more tolerant of the sweet potato flavor in it because it's so dry. The sort of squishy sweet potato flavor of mame, I don't really like maybe. But do you, do you see suggestions that these trees are selfing? Yes, Edgar Valdez. Yes. I've heard there may be pollination issues or something and you need two of these giant trees or... For leucoma? Yeah. I don't know actually, that could be an issue. Um, I haven't gotten to the point where I have pollination issues with it, so yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so John's right. Edgar Valdivia's place is where I've seen it fruiting a lot. I've also seen it fruiting a lot in um, some colder locations in San Diego. So, you know, the so cold location in San Diego is still not Northern California, but there are spots that do get some frost. Yeah, leucoma is definitely much drier. Cool. Well, so great to have all these minds together tonight. Um, it a really great turnout. Um, and yeah, eager to hear folks' suggestions for future CRFG programming. Um, always eager for Broth to come back with whatever he's he's got to tell us. And uh, yeah, should we should we all say good night? Yeah, sounds good. And maybe Andy, you can uh, talk about the the Santa Cruz Orchard sometime. I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, I, I gotta think about how to talk about that. This is something we've been doing for six or seven years now, almost a um, few different sites, high school some city park, small plantings, but increasingly diverse, biodiverse, and uh, just bringing in a lot, of, a lot of people to experience new things in horticulture and just experiencing different modes of land usage and how to, you know, draw nutrition and pleasure from the, the stuff of the earth, which is really eye-opening for a lot of people. Yeah, likewise, I'd like to I could listen to the whole presentation on your uh, Greenway project. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think I got to go and help with getting it back in good shape before uh, talking about it again. That's yeah, nice. that sounds like a real uphill battle with... We've been having issues. water issues. Yeah, lately. that was something I secured with my projects, and that's something I've kind of made a baseline requirement for any kind of public planting is reliable and automated water. I, I do actually have one really random thing to mention, which I guess I could have mentioned in the talk, but didn't. Um, one other crazy thing that I've been looking into, and this is kind of crossing research with planting, is using banana orchards as a fire break. 
And so I'm studying using the fire simulations to try to understand if we were to plant banana orchards using gray water infrastructure in Southern California at the urban wildland interface, cool. then you could, you could basically create a fire break that would prevent spread into populated areas. Because there's and, a succulent. Yeah. And, and then you'd also get the main problem with fire breaks is that they're usually, you either change it from one drought tolerant species to another, which still doesn't decrease the, the fuel amount that much, or you change it, but you, now you have to pay for upkeep of that land because it's not productive land. And with bananas, it may actually be, you know, agriculturally productive and may actually produce a profit especially in a lot of these Southern California neighborhoods where they put in gray water infrastructure long ago. And so the gray water is effectively free. So you have full well, irrigation water and it has a bunch of sort of NPK coming in it too, because they haven't filtered that out yet. Yeah. I wonder if that effluent, the volume of effluent would support a plantation of sure. the density required to serve that. Per That's a cool idea. I've heard so Pajoa, Pajoa have been used as uh, fire breaks as well because apparently mm -hmm. they are actually fire uh, retardant to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. And it sounds like compared to the banana idea, with the other problem with the banana thing though is wouldn't it require a lot of like um, composting that sort of thing, right? But I think you can be pretty neglecting of the Pajoa. You mean composting for nutrients? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Fruit, so that's why we, of, yeah, fruiting and stuff. Yeah. So we would re rely on the nutrients that's in the, the gray water oh, infrastructure. Gray water. Yeah. Um, okay. And so that's, it's really, it would only work in places that have gray water with has sort of effluent. It has some amount of, you know, mm -hmm. nutrients of various types. The main problem with the gray water often is that it's high salt. So uh -huh. you know, you're going to need to rely on some amount of heavy rainfall at least once per winter, which we sometimes get in Southern California. Um, gotcha. And the the other the other species that we're looking at is actually carob. Supposedly, carob is um, flame retardant to an extent. Um, there have been some studies in the Mediterranean where carob orchards will survive like a you know a regional fire where everything else has burned down. And so, carob might be viable as like a fire break in Northern California. I thought salt would be a limiting factor, but where I tried it, um, I've seen the most amazing growth on avocado where I planted it on laundry gray water. Hmm. Um, and I have them using biodegradable soaps, but you know, it's, it's on a higher grade. So drainage is less of an issue and just phenomenal, phenomenal growth with all that water and the minerals mm -hmm. haven't been an issue to this point. One thing that I remember reading, and maybe you, you've looked into it, is um, a lot of the biodegradable soaps, they use potassium hydroxide, and so you don't get the sodium salts. Is that, huh. is that the reason that you I don't end up with the salt problem? I haven't really studied the biochemistry of it. That's a good okay. question. Um, so, oh, uh, John was saying spineless prickly pear cactus. Oh, I actually want to see the real, is there a real spinely spineless prickly pear. I know that there was the, the, the old um, uh, ones that were like almost spineless, but Perfect. I don't know. If, yeah. I have a few spineless. spineless varieties, but the spines, the thorns aren't really the problem. It's those the little glochids. invisible okay. glochids that just yeah. bur burrow under your skin right into your soul. Yeah. Um, and there's there's some that are almost free of those, but there's usually a little remnant bit. And a little bit is actually worse than a lot because then you, you don't take the precaution. Arguably, yeah. So but bananas. there's some phenomenal, phenomenally tasty opuntias and actually mm -hmm. some folks around here with great collections. Reed, who you saw earlier, who's on our board, he's got eight or so really good uh, prickly pears he's cultivating now and some other people. Yeah. So yeah, it'd be nice to try prickly pear for a fire break, maybe mixing it. One thing that I've been actually trying to find is that bananas are not sufficient. Like they'll be 80% of the solution, but then you need a succulent ground cover that is uh, not interfering with the bananas. 
and normal sort of freeway ice plant is a little bit too it, it, a little bit too high growing that it has an under layer of like dry stuff that could still catch fire. And so there are some other like succulent ground covers that are a little shorter. I'm curious if anybody has any suggestions for ones that seem like a good idea. Hmm. You can email me if you think of one layer or something. Um, but you know, it's sort of complementary to the bananas. But for bananas in particular, um, I think the dwarf Brazilian is really an excellent cultivar. Um, it, it's a really tasty apple banana family banana, um, but it doesn't have the intense apple flavor that some of the apple bananas have. It has just enough of a hint of apple, um, really sweet and creamy. Um, you know, the ones that I grew in, uh, at my relative's place, you know, everybody we gave them to was asking for a pup because it was just, it was really nice fruit. Um, Goldfinger is a pretty decent variety. It's kind of Cavendish-like, I guess. Nothing exciting, but, you know, it's a decent fruit. Um, the, I've had some other apple bananas, like the Mysore-type apple bananas. Um, those are pretty good. I, I guess I don't like the intense apple flavor. I like just a hint of the apple flavor. Um, and then there are plantain types. Um, I don't really have any, dis I can't distinguish the plantain types too much, so I don't really know which one's better or worse. Orinoco is a plant plantain type that is pretty commonly grown. It's pretty vigorous. Um, and so I've grown a tall Orinoco and I think a dwarf Orinoco. Um, and then I grew one that I just mysteriously called a plantain, uh, or a bayou plantain that I got a pup from somebody who lives in like Southern Louisiana that just grows them on the bayou. And apparently it's very vigorous and it's related to Saba. Saba is an interesting one that is an extremely large uh, like plant. Uh, Saba and Candrian were both grown at 20, 25 feet. Um, like I planted a Candrian in LA uh, in I think September or October last year. And by June, it was about 15 feet tall. So, you know, some of these will grow really fast if you really want a tall, tall plant. Yeah, locally I've tasted Goldfinger and Namwa, and I mm -hmm. think for Foronoco, I'm growing ice cream. I think that's fruitings various places. Mm -hmm. And so they ripen pretty but, well in Santa Cruz? It takes some doing. You, you, you want a hot spot or a wall, but um, I'm, people are doing it, yeah. I try to plant on a south-facing exposure. Mm -hmm. If anyone Jeez. wants to chime in, you should be able to unmute yourself or just go to bed. I think I'm going to do that soon. Yeah. Uh, I'm growing bananas and I haven't had any, you know, any fruits yet, but I'm really worried just about the length of the year and, you know, getting a big flower and getting ready and hearing about it dying midwinter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happens. One, one trick I've done in a couple of cases is I just induce the flowering early. So basically plant it so that you can, you time it so that it gets to the point where it's ready to flower in sometime in early spring. But in Northern California, you usually don't have enough heat. And so then I induce the flowering by giving it a lot of potassium. So like a lot of banana peels, or you can just get a bloom booster uh, fertilizer and then water it for a week or two with like moderately warm water from the house in addition to normal water. And so it kind of tricks this, you know, gets the soil more, like temperature up enough that it starts thinking about flowering. And so if you can induce the flowering in early spring, then you don't have to have it hold the bunch over the winter when it might die. Hmm. Thank you. 